I'm Mark Weber of the Computer History Museum, and I'm here on December 10th, 2020, with Ray Ozzy, who's a pioneer of groupware and many other things. And um, thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, let's just start with uh, your full name and when and where you were born. Raymond Edward Ozzy, uh, Chicago, Illinois, uh, uh, 1955. Yeah. And tell me a bit about the family. So we were um, kind of a middle class family, uh, first growing up in uh, um, within the city in, in Chicago, eventually uh, moving out to the suburbs uh, out near O'Hare. Um, uh, you know, the uh, father was an insurance agent, said, I don't care what you do in life as long as you're not in an insurance agent. Um, uh, you know, my, my f grandfather, uh, we lived with them and he uh, worked in the railroad and uh, I spent a lot of time with him because we, we lived in a two flat together. He, it was, I think in retrospect, probably quite influential because he was a builder. You know, he was always, he would go to the railroad, he was a sheet metal worker, would come home, had this shop in the basement, and, you know, I would just sit in that shop watching him do things for hours on end, days on end, and uh, um, I think I probably have, uh, uh, you know, ingrained in my memory the, you know, subconscious, this, uh, this, the smells of of metalworking and uh, uh, what it's like to you know just be building, be building. <laughs> and you would help out or mostly watch. I would help out, but I would mostly watch. I was I was pretty young at the time, but you know it it um, uh, you know you never know how things influence you. But um, I was at a young age very. Um, very into electricity. My dad would bring home uh, dry cells and wires and knife switch and light bulbs and uh, you know I, I uh, learned about all of that probably in the third grade, fourth grade, you know, uh, 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 age range. I remember um, being very proud of myself in terms of what I what I knew, and I uh, uh, had made a made a little uh, a few quarters on the side by uh, selling new doorbell buttons for you know to the neighbors and uh, you know things like that. Um, and um, uh, hey, hey, Ray, could interrupt. hey Ray, could you be aware that you're rotating your chair back and forth? I will now be aware of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. I'm going to start it again. Here we go. So let's. Oh, and I was about to ask, um, you're talking about selling doorbells. <laughs> but I was about to ask, how about the classics of either model trains or radio? Oh yeah, very into, into model trains, especially again, because my grandfather was, you know, worked for the Illinois Central. Um, you know, my parents got me, uh, you know, trains and built a big train set uh, on a massive piece of plywood. Um, uh, you know, it was a, it was a, it was probably a pretty typical um, way of growing up in that in that generation. You know, as I, um, you know, as I grew older, as the, um, as as we started uh, into the '60s, um, you know, um, very into what was happening with NASA, and uh, you know, obviously, you know, uh, followed each and every launch but we all did at the time they brought tvs into the classrooms and we got to watch each you know each one of them yeah and um radio was that yep any interest or? i had a uh, uh one of my gifts my uncle bought me a crystal radio and you know i built that and um you know early on my my grandfather had a short wave and uh, we played with that, you know, a little bit. So, mm -hmm. what did your mother do? Uh, homemaker. Um, she stayed home with us. My my older sister and my younger brother. And um, tell me a little bit about your neighborhood. Um, 
you know, sort of what, what the environment is like around physically. Sure. Uh, in Chicago, um, uh, you know, fairly deep in the city, uh, near an amusement park called Riverview. Uh, uh, for those in Chicago from that era, they'd know kind of where that is. But um, uh, in, a, in a two flat, very modest, in a very ethnic uh, German Greek uh, neighborhood. Um, uh, by the time I was in second grade, we moved out uh, to the very edges of Chicago near the suburbs, a little area called Edison Park, and it was a tiny little home, but it was our, you know, our first first house, and um, eventually we just hopped over the border into Park Ridge, and uh, that's where I lived and, uh, uh, until I moved to the East Coast um, after college, and so my mom still lives. <laughs> and can I ask you what values you're raised with, with politics, religion, or ethics, a big part of your family life? Uh, very religious, Catholic. Um, you know, I was an altar boy. Um, uh, you know, everyone in the in the neighborhood was. Um, you know, we 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 didn't have a ton of money. You know, we we. But I didn't know that. Um, you know, we walked to school. You know, my 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 parents were very focused tremendously on um, contributing to society and uh, doing so modestly. Um, you know, if you show modesty and respect, uh, that was kind of at the core. And you know, my my grandfather, who we, my grandparents, who we lived with, uh, were strict in that regard. My parents were very consistent with it. Um, and that's how it was. And talk a little bit about school. What were your favorite topics, least favorite, important teachers? <laughs> so I was pretty um, fortunate in, uh, to have gone to a, uh, a great high school. It was uh, uh, Maine South, Maine Township uh, High School South. And it was a relatively new high school, um, only open for a year or two uh, when I went there. Um, and it was a combination um, uh, uh, high school that had two very distinct tracks, an academic track and a trade track. Um, uh, if you were academic, you were heading you know, off to college and it was all college prep. Um, and my scores you know, tended to, uh, um, encourage the advisors to make me uh, want to go in that direction. Um, however, my interest took me more toward the trade side, um, and I did pretty much everything that I could on that side. There was a uh, uh, wood shop, auto shop, print shop, um, uh, but what uh, interested me most was they had an electrical shop, and, and these, every time I say shop, there was a very large area dedicated to these things. Um, uh, with lots of equipment. Um, uh, in electrical shop, um, they, uh, uh, they used uh, old Navy training films to begin teaching students uh, the fundamentals of electronics. At the time, it was all vacuum tube based, um, but it's still the basic, you know, the, the same basic concepts of amplifiers and, and so on. Um, you know, the, we uh, began with those films, but eventually uh, took apart TVs and radios and uh, tried to fix them and tune them and so on. And this gave me a, a really healthy basis in, uh, in electronics that, that ended up um, um, paying dividends uh, later on in, in life. Um, but what was probably most interesting and most coincidental is that um, the high school apparently, now I understand this in retrospect, was part of a uh, a grant program that um, uh, the federal government had um, had granted some number of high schools uh, across the country um, uh, both time sharing and computer hardware resources to try to get the um, the general population to start to begin to understand uh, computers and computing technology. So uh, in freshman uh, algebra, 
uh, the very first, probably within weeks of, of starting high school. Uh, my math teacher at the time, David Paisley, um, came into the classroom and just said, look, um, uh, we were just delivered in the math department uh, all of this equipment. We have no idea what to do with it, and we're looking for a few volunteers uh, who can just start playing with it and teach us, uh, teach us what it's all about. And so I and uh, two other people uh, in different classes um, had volunteered to go in and begin playing with it. And uh, there, were, there was essentially a teletype um, connected to prior time-sharing system, uh, and it supported two languages, BASIC and FORTRAN. And uh, next to it, there was a, um, what I believe is probably credited as the, the world's first personal computer, Olivetti Underwood Programma 101. And there's a couple of them, you know, back there. Uh, wonderful machine. It, you know, today you would call it a programmable calculator. Um, but it had all the, you know, four registers and all the basic looping constructs. Um, and so between uh, um, using this time-sharing system uh, and teaching myself uh, BASIC and FORTRAN um, and uh, using the personal computer, um, I began to have a good basis in, in what programming was all about. And again, that was um, fall of, yeah, September of... 1969, um, and you know my classmates didn't understand what I was doing. My the, the my parents didn't understand this, um, but uh, uh, the teachers in the math department were they encouraged us, you know, tremendously. And you know, if I if you map out the time frames exactly, um, Paul Allen and Bill Gates had the exact were part of the exact same program at Lakeside in. Um, um, in Seattle and so on. It, so for, for some of us, it gave us a little bit of a uh, head start and a peek at uh, what this would all become. And in that period, um, what did you want to be when you grew up? And how that changed from maybe earlier when you were small? That's a great question. No, you know, I, I think when I was small, you don't think about these things consciously, but you know, I, I, I knew what I enjoyed, and I enjoyed building. Um, uh, you know, in high school, I didn't spend a lot of time on academics. I was in AP courses, and I didn't do all that well because I didn't put a lot of effort into it. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, did, I did well enough. But, I, but everything I would think about, you know, in the off time was... was either on the, the um, in my relationship with the person who ran um, the uh, electrical, electronics, you know, kind of track, and uh, on the theater side. I spent an immense amount of time uh, doing technical theater, uh, lighting and sound, and that, that probably took more of my time and passion over the, over the uh, you know, last, a couple years of, of high school. However, that's also where I began um, doing uh, summer jobs um, at a place where my mom worked. Uh, uh, she was a, an executive assistant uh, uh, to the CFO at, a, um, at, an at an insurance company, Protection Mutual, and their uh, data processing department had uh, uh, some, you know, summer jobs open, and so I was. I began to do some programming there also um, in languages that wonderful languages like RPG and uh, <laughs> things like that. By the way, it's very interesting that you had you were exposed at the same time to both something like a personal computer that was hands on as well as being connected online, which obviously both those themes came in later. Right. Um, the, the, the online, I have to tell you, it was, you know, it was, a, it was a funny era. We were allocated as students a very strict budget of funny money. You know, uh, for those who, you know, for, for, for people, kids especially now, it's very difficult to understand this concept, but Online time cost money, and so they so and every time you would 
uh, dial in. You would take, you know, dial the phone, listen for the sound, put the phone in the acoustic coupler, and then start typing online. It would be deducting um, uh, credits. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how many cents per hour or per minute uh, it was deducting, but we had very strict budgets. So I would a, a typical after school or before school session would be to quickly type in you know something or run a paper tape through to to um, enter this program I had been working on, get the results, and then hang up quickly because, so you didn't deduct you know as, um, you didn't use up all your money for the for the month, whereas the personal computer it was empowering I mean you could sit there and play with it and play with it and play with it. Uh, as, as much as you, you know, as much as you wanted. And, you know, that, that was also instilled very early on. And so later in career, as we'll talk, talk about it, um, when I was exposed to the potential of doing personal computing, um, you know, you could just feel, uh, you know, or uh, um, that, I, that you were drawn to the, the personal computer just because of that empowerment. And you and you did on the um, on the timeshare one. I think you had said you'd written a golf game. And <laughs> wrote a wrote a very simple um, a very simple golf game. Then I found out that there was already one online, and theirs was better, so I stopped working on that. Um, did ma did some math problems, uh, you know, that corres corresponded to what we were uh, learning in algebra and so on. And obviously, you have. Because of the time constraints, you were doing all of that offline. That's right. Quickly, but on the program, uh, could you sit there and really uh, program it? Yeah, you. What you would do yeah. in in both of those cases, you would do your you do you would do your work more or less on paper, and then on the uh, Programma One Hundred and One, they had uh, you would enter it, and then you could save it on a magnetic card. Um, uh, and you know when you began the next day, you could just put the magnetic card in and start with that and use the keys to edit um, what was going on and then save it again on the um, i 'm pointing this way because there 's a teletype over there, and the magnetic cards are back there <laughs> um, but on the teletype again, you would um, essentially when you began uh, your day, you would load up your program that you were working on with paper tape. Run it through, and it just you know typed it as it was enter as it was uploading it. You would do your work. You would edit with line numbers in BASIC and so on. Uh, you know your program, uh, get it working, and then print it again to tape um, when you were done. Um, and then and there and your buddy might be waiting for you to get off the thing so he could uh, you know get on and use it. And. Um... So that, what made you uh, think of University of Illinois, Champaign? My dad went to University of Illinois on the GI Bill, and that uh, uh, we really didn't, you know, we had to, have, from an economic perspective, a state school was the only real choice. I, um, I applied to several of the state schools, but um, it was, it was kind of a fait accompli. That was, if I got in, that was where I was going to go. And I, I majored um, in electrical engineering um, going in there at the time. They, I believe their math department had a nascent computer science curriculum, um, uh, maybe even on the engineering side. Uh, but it was very, it was only several years old um, at the time. Um, so I started. Uh, um, you know, the, in at, at Illinois, most of what you are uh, taking at the very, very beginning are not really uh, are, are not courses that are pertinent, deeply pertinent to your major um, at the beginning. Um, but I began uh, because I like building stuff. I, I got a a. Um, a part-time job on the side at uh, at the reactor, the Department of Nuclear Engineering, and uh, began uh, building circuits uh, that are ne were needed by grad students. Um, they had a um, uh, uh, Lockheed Sioux 
mini computer, so I started playing with that because I knew how to code uh, from high school, but this was uh, probably the first time I had dealt with assembly language. Um, and uh, uh, one of the uh, technicians um, uh, asked me to help him build something um, that, that just kind of floored me. It was a, um, we had, he had just gotten one unit of a new chip, an Intel 8008 um, uh, chip, and he wanted to build a little, uh, a little computer around it. So we had fun doing that. Eventually, um, uh, you know, we got an 8080. Um, and it was, you know, it was mind blowing. I mean, this is, again, this is, to me, this is the next generation of the kind of personal computer that I had dealt with, um, uh, with the Programma 101. Um, but it was just so amazing to learn. Um, yeah. And, um, and you had talked about, you, you did computer science, but within electrical engineering, but there were other op, there were other, there were like two or three flavors of CS, right? Yeah, the, 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 way, this, the way this story went, um, uh, as a freshman, I did kind of what, we're, what we were just talking about, the basic curriculum and starting to work. And um, as usual, consistent with uh, my personality of what I had done in high school, I worked more than, I worked on what I enjoyed doing more than I, uh, my academics, uh, uh, and so um, I had a choice at the end of my first year to either drop out or be kicked out. Um, uh, so I, uh, I withdrew, uh, got a job um, uh, in Chicago uh, or in the suburbs uh, at a company called Vapor Corporation working initially uh, just in the factory, but I told them I had an interest in electronics and some background. So they put me into the uh, uh, test lab of their electronic test lab, and I learned more and more and more about electronics. They had an early mini computer they didn't understand how to use, so I started showing my my boss, um, you know, how to how to use uh, some of these things, and they were. Um, I was I was extremely happy. I was I was tremendously happy. But the people who worked there said, "You are an idiot. Um, uh, if you don't go back to college, uh, you're going to be stuck in this in this lab in 20, 30 years. So um, so leave. Just you know leave." And so the uh, uh, the next uh, I think the second semester I think I was I had dropped out for a semester the second semester of what would have been my sophomore year I went back with my dad down there begging uh, to get back in um, and I got back in and at that time um, the advisor basically looked at everything that I'd done he said why don't you go into computer science why don't you uh, you know the the we're investing more and more and more in the um, electrical engineering uh, side of computer science. And so, um, you know, as I said, there were three, there were three flavors. There was math, uh, there was a computer science in the math department, a, um, a computer engineering in electrical engineering, which was more or less building computers, and uh, computer science in the computer science department. So I went into that, that third one. Um, and it was tremendous. It was it was great. It, you know, it was a dream come true. We, um, uh, I I got to graduate from using a teletype to using a key punch. Um, uh, we would uh, do our programming on paper um, and uh, go to you know punch punch it in into you know Hollerith cards and have card decks. And submit those card decks to uh, to the window uh, with JCL on, on the front of it. It was an IBM uh, three sixty seventy five, I believe it was. Um, uh, and uh, um, you know, you would wait hours. You would just wait hours and hours and hours uh, um, in the in the uh, lobby of the digital computer lab uh, at the time. 
with everyone else and, and, event, and you'd keep checking and eventually they would put your listing in your box and, and uh, so on. Um, and uh, at the time I was doing this, um, you know, you would, you would go take a walk or go get a slice of pizza or something. Directly across the street from the digital computer lab, there was this other building. Um, and it, on the, the nameplate of the building, it was called Computer-Based Education Resource Lab. Um, I, had no, I had no idea what it was, but if you look through the windows um, at night, which is when you do most of your coding, um, there, was, there, there was this orange glow coming through the windows. Um, and you know, it, I peeked in the windows, and there were just people sitting at rows and rows and rows of um, these things I'd never seen before. Um, and uh, uh, I went inside, and these things were interactive terminals. And so whereas in my curriculum I was using um, punch cards to submit card decks, um, these were, uh, the system was called PLATO, uh, which is an acronym for Programmed Logic for Automated Teaching Operations. Um, um, but this was a computer-based education system, um, uh, and these things were terminals. The terminals had 512 by 512 plasma panel, graphic displays, and keyboards, and all these people um, uh, were sitting there. Um, if it was before 10 p.m., they were doing a curriculum. They were students who were, who were using those terminals for, um, you know, for their English as a Second Language course or their chemistry course and so on. And after 10 p.m., um, a different set of people would come in, and it was a mix between people doing programming and people doing gaming. Um, uh, and, and in any case, I just was fascinated by this thing. I lost interest, of course, in punched cards because I'm like, what, what are these things? How, how do I get involved in this? Um, and, you know, I learned, tried to learn more about it. Um, Plato was um, uh, started by a uh, creative eccentric uh, uh, named Don Bitzer. And, uh, um, uh, you know, he, um, uh, well, actually, there were, there were several, you know, as in many of these projects. Uh, Dan Albert got, um, you know, I believe conceived of the, of the initiative and got the funding. Don was um, a real hustler and a, a real motivator. But he was, uh, he took the project from Plato One um, in the, uh, 60, uh, you know, probably 1960. Early 60s. That's right. Um, through um, uh, through uh, what the one that I was using, which was Plato IV, um, in the early 70s. And how did you? I mean, the, the your professors uh, did not introduce you. You made the connection to this group. Absolutely not. Yeah, there there was a wall between the. Um, uh, computer science, anybody who was doing serious computer science or computer engineering in the college, um, uh, uh, I don't want to say looked down upon, but you know, they certainly shunned uh, what was happening uh, at Computer Based Education Research Lab. CIRL is, is the acronym that, that uh, we referred to. Um, it was just a different world. It was more. Um, uh, associated with the education department, um, uh, and uh, Don Bitzer was a physicist, so uh, it was very much associated with, uh, you know, he also taught physics, um, so there was a, 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 an associ association there. But they weren't doing serious computer science. They were just using the technology as a solution. And Don was such a um, such a, a brilliant character in my in my mind, um, you know. I, it's probably difficult for people to imagine right now, but memory at that time was the um, uh, the core constraint. Um, you know, you uh, I haven't done the math uh, lately, but I it it would probably be no. It would probably be accurate to say that it would cost at least a hundred k. Um, uh, to put the kind of memory 
uh, the size of memory that you would need to back up a 512 by 512 uh, display, graphical display, into a terminal. And these were not computers, these were terminals. They were built out of TTL logic. Um, you know, they were connected to a mainframe with a serial link. And so, so they had to somehow retain the image that was on the screen. And the, the technology at the time for graphics was storage tubes. Um, you know, you would have, uh, you know, an electron beam hit phosphor and the, pho and the image would stay on the phosphor and you'd have to refresh it um, periodically. But that was the, um, if you had a terminal, that was kind of the, um, uh, the technology that kept the image on the screen. But Don basically uh, said, no, I, I, we need graphics terminals for, um, uh, for teaching. Uh, and being a physicist, um, he thought about the problem and he and a couple of uh, uh, collaborators invented the plasma panel um, and used it for that purpose. Um, each of those orange dots that I was talking about on the screen um, was a, um, a dot on the, on the plasma panel you know, array and it had self-memory. It retained the image um, on the screen, which was the only way they could make this affordable. So Don, being a hustler, they did the invention, then they did a deal with a, an Illinois-based company, Owens Corning, um, uh, or maybe it was Owens, Illinois at the time. Um, uh, and uh, they fabricated the panels and made these things, and it was, it was incredible. And they, essentially, Don um, had this attitude that he in, instilled in everyone who worked for him, uh, which was, if you can imagine it, you can build it. That, that's it. You know, that, the, and, and if you have a solution that requires technology, you just build the technology to accomplish that solution. You do whatever you need to do. You don't have to worry about, um, is it the right thing to build? Is it the right architecture? You just build the solution and solve the problem. And he had a belief that uh, computers could ultimately um, impact uh, uh, the nature of teaching and the nature of learning. Um, and that, and that was his passion. I am curious, because for the CS people, even if a lot of us was applications like for education, I mean, seeing essentially a graphical terminal um, at a much lower cost, I mean, were they even aware of that? Was there so little communication? I mean, it seems like some of the, the technical things would have been interesting even Independent of their use. I am certain that the computer science people looked at it. Um, uh, you know, there were, we had visits from um, Dave Liddell from Park and, and, you know, others. I remember, you know, people coming out to understand it. And there were so many nuances of what to understand because um, uh, there's a, an entire software fork and a, hard, and, a, and a hardware and systems engineering, um, you know, thread, um, you know, on the, on, the, uh, on the software side to do that learning software. Uh, there was a, 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 another amazingly creative gentleman named uh, Paul Tenzar who built a system, an authoring system, uh, and a language called Tutor. It looked very much like Python, wh whereas it used indentation for uh, structure. Um, uh, you know, as opposed to braces or, you know, things like that. Um, uh, but it had a, very, a control flow that was very um, amenable to writing lessons. It had units, it, all the terminology was units, and it would jump to units or call units and come back. Um, and one of the most powerful things was a natural language-based answer judging system. Um, nothing, they did not believe uh, in this style of education, they didn't believe in multiple choice. So um, uh, you would set up a vocabulary of words and you would map out concepts and uh, words to eliminate and things like that. And it would put a little arrow prompt and ask a question after you learned certain material. And it would say, you know, uh, how would you compute the square root of, uh, you know, n? And you would type an answer, and it would judge the answer, and it would put little X's around for uh, words that shouldn't be there, a little arrow where you're missing words. Um, and, it, and just that um, 
uh, until recently, um, you know, uh, clearly it wasn't using AI. It was using very straightforward procedural methods. Um, but it was a fascinating thing. And yes, people, people from the computer science community looked at it. But um, I don't believe it had um, the, the level of publishing um, that would be associated with a, um, uh, an, an academic project. They, they definitely published, but they did not publish an immense volume. Um, and Don um, was a promoter. So he would go, he went on what at the time was a very popular show, the Phil Donahue show, um, uh, and, and, and tried to explain to the general public what, is, what are computers? What is computer-based education? He would go and visit different governments and, and, and try to promote it. Um, and I think the nature of promotion um, turned off uh, the serious academics um, and, and led to a lot of it, uh, a lot of the reason why it, it ended up filling a niche that was uh, probably less heard of than, than other projects. And did that translate at all? To, was that comfortable for you being sort of between? I'm a I'm a builder. I love building. I wasn't. I you know I wasn't. I didn't envision myself as a, as an academic. Oops, sorry. No, but I mean like the politics of you were in the CS department. But I presume, and you'll tell me, you were starting to spend more and more time with Plato. I mean, I, how did I, how did your advisors feel? About I, well, great question. Um, great question. Um, my advisors, uh, my formal advisor, um, didn't quite know what to make of it. He didn't really, um, you know, he just looked at the output. He looked at the grades. He looked at the amount of time I was spending on it. He was encouraging me. Uh, you know, he said, look what happened to you. You're back. You're given another chance. Don't blow it. Um, so I, you know, I allocated my time appropriately to do just barely what I needed to do, but clearly, you know, B work, you know, just barely B work. Um, uh, um, but I was spending an immense amount of time. Eventually, I begged and borrowed to, tr to try to get a job uh, within Plato. I went to Paul Tenzar because I'm a software. Well, I was kind of between hardware and software, but I envisioned myself more uh, on the software side uh, as a future. So I went to Paul Tenzar and I just I, I literally begged. I mean, I just said, I'll do anything that you want. What, what kind of projects do you, do you need? You know, um, and they pay minimum wage. I think it was $1.75 an hour or something, you know, like that. But, um, but he gave me a project. Um, I, I went to, I, I asked my advisor, was anybody in the computer science department um, familiar with Plato, supportive of it? And there was one gentleman, uh, uh, George Friedman, um, who uh, had an account and tried to teach his course using Plato, uh, CS 109. Um, and so um, I, I spent some time with him. He, want, he thought it would be great to have a logo interpreter um, uh, built on, on Plato. So concurrently, on the, I did the logo interpreter project for George, and I, I began working um, on a project for uh, for Paul Tenzar um, as a job, and you know I, I just became immersed, just tremendously immersed um, in the system and the environment. By the way, I forgot to ask you how. What was your parents' reaction when you? when you did have to leave after the first year. <laughs> they, I presume there was some pressure to yeah, there were, as the, well. Huh? Huge disappointment. I mean, no, huge, huge disappointment. Huge disappointment. Um, my dad was quite cynical in terms of he just thought I'd never go back. And he, having gone there in the GI Bill, he loved Illinois. We went down there for football games when I was a kid all the time. It, you know, he, 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 it really, he put it on a pedestal, you know, a very high. And he was just disappointed that uh, I would have let that opportunity go by. Everything was about opportunity. You know, you don't, you don't let, you have opportunities, you take advantage of those opportunities, you make the best of them. And um, very disappointed. Um, 
and that's why when 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 I did want to get back in, he used you know every bit of uh, himself from a guilt perspective <laughs> in me to try to make sure that I took it seriously and uh, um, you know and with the dean you know trying to persuade him that I was a good kid and that I wouldn't blow it this time. Um, but I, you know, I, I wish I could say it I worked. Right? Hmm? I it, mean, it worked in the sense that in this second year you were, you were keeping up the beat, even though you found something it, even more fascinating. It, it worked. To distract it, you. it worked. It worked. But the history of my schooling, including all the rest of college, was just riding on the hairy edge. You know, just riding on the edge of what I needed to accomplish versus, uh, so that I could do what I was passionate about. Um, uh, um, you know, I ended up being on the five-year plan, you know, not just because I uh, uh, was out, but because I had to drop a couple courses to keep the average, you know, up, which postponed the ultimate uh, graduation. But, um, but I loved, I absolutely loved Plato. I loved the fact that um, uh, it, it was the first time I did, I was part of a team, a development team, um, uh, working you know, toward a common objective. It was the first time I was, um, I understood viscerally the concept of leadership and followership. Uh, you know, the fact that you are, you collectively are believing in this vision and the person who's giving the vision through their um, you know, inspiration and other techniques is getting you to work like crazy to get to accomplish this, uh, this joint goal. Um, first time I learned about politics, organizational politics and backstabbing and you know, all the things that, that are just part of any um, organizational culture. Um, but um, I learned a lot about technology. Um, you know, the, uh, um, I was on the system staff of, of Plato. I, I was not um, developing lessons. I was working on the, the tutor language interpreter and runtime. Um, Which was higher status within that group. Oh, much higher status, yeah. It, yes. the, the, um, the, with, with, in Plato, you had a, a two, uh, instead of just having a username like many computer systems, there was a username and a group. Um, and the group was usually the course you were taking. Like uh, if I was in CS109 as a student, my group would have been CS109 and my name would have been Ozzy. Um, uh, um, the group uh, P was student system programmers who were part time and S was full-time system programmers. And there was an immense status associated with, um, with those, uh, uh, they called them sign-ons, but you know, credentials. And so I got to be a P and um, you know, I worked on language features. Um, uh, I worked on one feature that um, uh, took advantage of both of my hardware and software knowledge. They were, it was the first, um, programmable terminal that, I don't know if you can see back there, but there's a, um, uh, that tan colored thing is a, uh, a Plato 4 terminal, you know, in, in TTL, but this was the, they were, we were developing the first Z80 based terminal and it still had a plasma panel, but it used a processor um, to, in, to do the communications and to interpret the, uh, the, the, um, uh, what was coming down the stream, but also um, I wrote these commands to do local intelligence, like draw a circle. Um, so that was moving the circle logic from the mainframe, which was sending dot commands down to the terminal where it could just draw a circle. Um, and I added an animation command where, where you would load a, what today we would call a sprite. Um, and you would say, I want that sprite to move from here to there with this velocity. And the lesson, you know, the early uh, users of those terminals um, started to take ad advantage of these things. So um, uh, it was, it was immen immensely fun. So really a sort of client server architecture. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and um, 
you know, as a part of this, I was learning about systems programming because um, I, if you were, if you wrote, this was a an interpretive language, and the interpreter is running on a control data mainframe, very expensive mainframe, um, you know, connect with about a thousand terminals connected to it, 500 on campus, 500 in pockets of four around the world. And if you make an error in your assembly language, um, it crashes the system and a thousand people are, <laughs> are very disappointed. Um, no pressure. Yeah, well, and, and, and you know, you make mistakes and you only do work from 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. That was what was called non-prime time. That was where we all worked. But I had to learn certain programming disciplines so you don't, you aren't dangerous. And there were um, very strong uh, figureheads in the development team, um, full-time people, who would really make it difficult for you if you were, you know, first of all, if you were dangerous, you do it once, everybody does it once. You do it twice or do you do it, uh, you know, a little bit, they'll try to mentor you. You do it a little bit often. You're off. You're out. You're fired. That's that's it. Because it, it, the damage is just too great. So they were, they were, mentoring uh, in programming style through their code. You would look at their code. You would ask um, one of the other junior programmers who reported to them what, why they did it this way, and you know it was you were just up upping your game. Upper, upping your game progressively. Now the, there was a microfilm reader in some of the Pyto terminals, right? We're That's right. The, the top of the terminal is a, is a microfiche. It's a, small, um, it's a small piece of you know, acetate that has a matrix of, of um, uh, eight by eight um, images and essentially the back of the plasma panel is ground glass and while you would be writing text and graphics like arrows um, uh, on the in the on the plasma panel the lesson could select an image that would be projected you know onto the back of the of the ground glass furthermore um, you can't see it from here uh, a subset of the terminals that were used in the foreign language department um, have a, um, a disk reader. It's a f essentially a floppy disk, a piece of magnetic material that is about that big. Um, and it would have audio tracks on it. And so when, when you would execute the tutor command, put this image up, you could also s say play track uh, you know, 17. And it would you know, seek and, and play it into the student's headphones. It was a multimedia terminal in the uh, you know in the early '70s, and it was immensely innovative. But the part that um, you know to, to try to shift this conversation a bit, the part that fascinated me the most um, was the fact that there was the beginning of um, uh, communications and online community. Um, I don't think we talked about it that way, but you had, because there were 500 terminals on campus, on a very large campus in, in pockets all over the campus, um, uh, and 500 terminals in other places around the world, um, people needed a way, the, the developers of the lessons, um, the authors, would need ways to collaborate with other people and share information with other people. So. Um, one of the students, um, um, or a couple of the students, uh, um, uh, David Woolley and, um, I'll think of it in a, in a moment, but a, a couple of students built a system of communications. We had initially started editing shared text files um, as the way of, of communicating with one another. Um, uh, then uh, there was this thing built called Notes. Uh, um, there was a thing called personal notes, which is today we would call email. It was notes that you could leave. It would show the, the person who was sending it, and it was a, a queue of, you know, of these things. And the body, um, uh, so you had personal notes and group notes. 
Um, in group notes, he would create these things called note files that were topical in nature. Like one of them might be called um, uh, public notes. And public notes would be uh, notes of general interest. Then there were system notes where if there were changes in the, you know, this was directed at the developers. You know, if there were changes in the programming language, you would have it there. And people would write a topic and people could enter responses to that topic. So essentially it was shared discussions um, uh, among the, the community. And finally, there was this thing called, it's an awkward name, it was, it's called Term Talk. Uh, term Talk was a, um, there was a, a button on the keyboard called Term. Um, remember, this is um, an education term system. And, and, well, it was an education system, and the purpose of the key was that a student at any time, if they didn't know what a term meant in the lesson, they could hit the term key, and it would come up with a prompt, and they would ask, the, uh, you know, they would type in the word and it would give a definition of that word. But there were system terms. So if you did term and type talk, it would erase the bottom two lines of the screen, ask you the user on Plato that you wanted to talk to, and immediately you were in an on -time, online real-time chat. Um, and it wasn't the kind of messaging that you and I know today where you send a line and you hit enter, you know, and the other person sees it. It was character at a time. So you, um, you know, I would type A, B, C, backspace, backspace, you know, uh, and that's what the person at the other side would see. Um, uh, and finally, there was this thing called Talkomatic, which um, essentially took that concept, but it had the concept of channels, where you might have you go into the Talkomatic lesson. And there would be four channels, or a number of channels. You select which one you want to go into. And then you were with a group of other people all talking like that. So to me, this concept of people communicating, it really, uh, that combined with the discussion tools, really, um, you started to get to know people very, very well at a distance. Um, uh, you'd get to know their personalities. You'd get to know what other people think of them. Um, you know, oh, this guy, this person's Im impressive. This person's a bozo. Um, uh, the, it, you just started to get used to being on the system, and we started to envision the system as a place, as opposed to just being um, a tool. Um, at the time, um, there was one thing that happened to me that was um, particularly noteworthy, and it kind of was career ultimately career defining. I was assigned by my boss, uh, Paul Tenzar, to work on a project temporarily with this gentleman named Gary Michael. Um, very short term project, but he needed some resource. He was remote. Um, he, he was in the Champaign Urbana area, but he was not um, at Searle where I where I worked. Um, so he sent me through personal notes and. Uh, he sent me specs of what he wanted to work on. Um, I could see the source code of the, part, of the um, partially implemented uh, feature. I worked on it. Um, I would send him um, questions by personal note. He would send me a reply. Occasionally, I would get stuck, and I would, I would term talk him to, to do it in real time. And even though his his notes, his personal notes, were extremely eloquent. I mean, just, just they were very concise. Um, when I talked to him online, he was just the worst typist you could ever imagine. Like, you would see a character typed, wait, a character typed, wait. I mean, it was just so frustrating, immensely frustrating. And eventually, I stopped doing it, but um, I, I just couldn't picture myself, how could this per somebody who's such a bad typist write up these long specs? Anyway, I forgot about it. I got, I got the, um, the project done, and he hosted a little party um, after, the, after the project to, um, to kind of celebrate. And I drove uh, out to his house um, in Champaign, uh, went in, and um, there were a bunch of people there. But immediately, I, I was, I mean, I, I, to this day, I, re, I, re, I remember this. Um, 
the reason why he was typing so slowly is he's a quadriplegic and uh, he was typing with a stick and I had no idea. I just had absolutely no idea. I suppose I should have asked somebody uh, or whatever, but I had just been assigned on this project. And the, it, it, it really, even at the time, even as a college student where you don't think about these things, um, it made me question my biases. Like it, it made me question, um, you know, am I treating people equitably uh, am I uh, you know because if I had seen him like that I never would have um, gone to what his mind is like I would have just been preoccupied with the fact that he's in this wheelchair um, uh, um, you know just barely able to get around um, and yet I had seen the other part of him and gotten to know the other part of him and his sense of humor before I ever saw him and that that really made me want to work on communication tools um, after I left school. It, it, it just, uh, to me, the, the nature of, of the computer being a, a communication tool was just, um, it was just, it was something I wanted to do. Um, look, it was a fascinating, it was a fascinating um, system. Um, everyone was there based on merit. Everyone was there based on interest and what, what they had to do. And if you were in a group, people left you alone and you were in that group. So for example, there was a thing called the Plato Corrections Project. And the Plato Corrections Project was, was someone had a passion that perhaps you could rehabilitate, rehabilitate prisoners by putting Plato terminals in a prison and writing um, tools to for, in repurposing many of the lessons that were used in college for them. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of skepticism at the very beginning, but, um, uh, you know, would the, these expensive Plato terminals be trashed? No, of course they weren't trashed. These people treated them very well. But the users, some of the prisoners began uh, uh, writing lessons. They became part of the game playing and discussion community. Uh, and so you just had an immense, you know, immensely interesting mix um, of people online. Again, just extremely appealing. We, those of us who were on Plato at the time, and this, the era that I was on was from 74 through 78, um, uh, 70, 79. Um, we got a peek of what the internet would ultimately become, you know, in a different form in a different way, um, but uh, the good things, the bad things about online community, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the entertainment aspect of it, the, the productivity aspect of it, and so on. And how I know that there were some connections between Plato and, for instance, there was what the uh, forums on the ARPANET and Jacques Vallée's uh, what was it? Well, first of all, Forum, every, I guess it was cool. Yeah, every. I mean, how aware were you guys, the average Plato user? Were you aware that there was anything like this anywhere? I mean, you, you mentioned um, Lick Leiter's and Taylor's paper, the computers and communications. Well, the, the, I mean, were you thinking? Yeah. You were in this island, or that it was part of the bigger... Well, first of all, we knew we were in an island because people told us we were in, in an island. I mean, it, the, it, we, it felt like an island, but even the people who came in from Park um, and others, you made it very clear there was nothing like this out there, and that, that it, was, it was an interesting curiosity. Um, we knew that there was someone out there, uh, I believe the system was called Participate, um, uh, but there was another conferencing system out there, um, yeah. uh, and uh, you know we didn't think about it. I mean, we were we were Im immersed in our in our own community, and and I was honestly not thinking of it academically. I was thinking of it because of the joy of building, um, because of the joy, the the immersion in this whole environment, and and. Um, only after I left did I have any idea 
number one, how much I would miss it, and number two, uh, how many innovations I had been fortunate enough to um, to have experienced. Um, you know, I I I loved so in the '78 time frame, the first wave of people who were my vintage, uh, who started school, who graduated from high school in my year, were leaving because they did four year. <laughs> Uh, they had four degrees in four years, and at that point in time, if you uh, were in our field, you went east or west. You went to the Bay Area or Boston, um, uh, because uh, the Bay Area is the Bay Area, and Boston uh, was the heart of the minicomputer era. You had um, Prime Digital Equipment Corporation, Data General. Um, it was, uh, you know, the... the we were still coming off the high of 128 being the uh, such an immense, uh, um, you know, ecosystem uh, in the defense industry and and uh, and so on. So it was, and there are a bunch of amazing schools out here. So um, everyone who uh, graduated um, had this decision: Am I going to be a West Coast person or an East Coast person? And you'd interview with companies. Well. The people who were my best friends, my buddies who I would hang out with all the time, they both went the, um, to DEC, to Digital Equipment Corporation on the East Coast. And they started sending back listings of what they were working on, um, uh, like stacks of paper, um, just to more or less entice. And the stuff was amazing. I mean, it was amazing. But I had not graduated yet. so. Um, uh, you know, I was um, kind of torn. I was trying to think about what's next and so on. I did so. I, so I interviewed. I interviewed at DEC, um, uh, four groups at DEC. Um, I was. I and on that same trip, I interviewed uh, with three groups at Data General. Um, I got my first uh, rejection letter, and that was uh, from DEC. Um, and I was just immensely, you know, disheartened. Just it was so bad. You know, my my contemporaries were over there. They were systems programmers on Plato. Uh, I was rejected. Um, uh, this really good new group who was building a new computer and new operating system at Data General uh, sent me an acceptance. So I I took it. Um, then I got three more acceptances from DEC and two more acceptances from Data General, but I stuck with Data General because I just had this thing about DEC because of uh, the, re the rejection. Um, so anyway, I, um, I moved out to the East Coast, and um, within, a, within, it probably took a month, uh, no more than a month, um, I started going through the same withdrawal that my friends had gone through which is there's no online community. Well, these these are computers being used for data processing and scientific reasons, uh, you know, engineering and scientific reasons, but nobody is using it to communicate with anybody. So I did, and Len Kaywell at um, DEC um, uh, did what we all did. We just wanted to recreate that. Uh, that communication. So, um, in the context of the computer that I was working on, I built a little notes thing. Len wrote a thing called KNotes for KOL Notes. Um, a guy by the name of, I think, Rob Kolstad wrote a Unix Notes. Um, uh, and, and, and it just started, you know, it just started infiltrating uh, uh, the environment. You know, the combination, the, having the combination of Personal notes and group notes, email and discussions, in some way, shape, or form, started, you know, kind of taking off as a pattern. Um, and I would party with those guys every weekend, and all we would talk about was, we're going to do a startup. We're going to do a startup, and we're going to recreate that communication, that online community. And we knew we had we couldn't recreate it in general because. There wasn't general purpose connectivity. Um, but within an enterprise or within an organization, a business, we could all see that ultimately there was going to be a computer on every desk. Of course, why not? 
and uh, a terminal at least on every desk and people would use it to communicate with each other so so we started you know like most every weekend we would just start talking about how that might take shape and why was it immediately a startup and not something to bring to either DAC or data general I mean, why were you so what made you so sure that it would not fly with those companies um I think a couple of reasons. Number one, because you would read stories about the Bay Area, and how, not so much about Boston, about the Bay Area, and how um, people were, you know, beginning to do startups. You know, whether it was hardware companies or this or that. Um, I worked. Data General at the time was considered a rebel startup, uh, trying to compete against DEC. DEC was a rebel startup against IBM, so. There was this ethos, you know, of that's what you do, um, and and they were hardware companies. Um, both of both, DEC and Data General at the time give gave away software to sell hardware. That was just what they did, and we had this, you know, the, really the thing that we wanted to create was the community, um, uh, more than anything else. And and I don't think we really even considered for a minute that that those companies uh, would be interested in it. And so so uh, Len and Tim um, basically uh, I kept talking about let's do this. I, I developed a business plan. Uh, let's do this. Um, and uh, we talked about this for for several years. Um, I I um, had had this tremendous boss at Data General. His his name was John Sachs. Is John Sachs, and um, our core group developing this new computer and new operating system um, was three people uh, of core developers. And there was a you know a second tier, but it was really a core of power architects slash developers. And um, it was a new computer architecture. It was based on this concept of a local area network, and. Uh, uh, intelligent uh, workstations and uh, print intelligent printing workstations that sat off the network. This was not common at the time. We thought we invented the LAN, which we didn't, of course. Um, um, but it was great. It was wonderful. But uh, two years into the project, my boss, who I loved, um, left the company to do a startup, and uh, he. He told me all about this new thing called VisiCalc, and how uh, he was going to do uh, a, a thing like VisiCalc, except a little better. Um, and he had this concept for it. Yeah. yeah. And you had talked before about Dave Cutler and hanging out with him, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Looking up to him. Yeah. While so, I, as I said, I hung out with my friends every every weekend. We were on the west side of Boston. That's where I lived. They were on the north side of Boston. So it was a decision to go hang out together. And every Friday, most every Friday, uh, uh, I would go meet them after work uh, at this place called the Rainbow Bar and Grill, and that was essentially where a bunch of uh, um, a bunch of people who are our age, because hiring was a big deal. There was a lot of people right out of college who had no, who came from somewhere else. And Dave Cutler, you know, he was kind. Of, he would kind of hold court with a pitcher of beer, and uh, um, you know, you you would you would drink a lot, and in in many cases end up over at Dave's house, and uh, you know, uh, and talk. And I met him at that time. Those listings that I had said were sent by my friends back to Plato. Those were kernel listings of Dave Cutler's uh, of the beginnings of what he what they were working on, which eventually would be called Vax and Vax, and they were working on this operating system called Vax VMS. Dave had just done a product called uh, RSX 11M, and he had just started. Um, you know, working on that, there were many people involved. Gordon Bell, um, you know, others on, on this project. Tremendously exciting project. So I, you know, we would compare notes. I would, 
show them this land-based operating system and hardware I was working on. They were, you know, doing this mini computer. Um, even though the companies were had very strict NDAs and it's East Coast, so they took it seriously, the people on the ground didn't care about that stuff. And they and even though we were competitors, they, you know, I saw all this stuff and I learned my early assembly language programming style um, by reading Dave's listings. Um, it was another level of sophistication um, beyond what I had seen um, working as a systems programmer on Plato. Um, John Sachs, my boss, had a very, um, he was also an, an amazing developer and, and was very into tight code. I would say Dave's Dave's strength was not just tight code, but architecture and organization of large projects of, of assembly language. And, and so when you're doing anything of, of complexity, it's, it's so wonderful to have the, that, that kind of mentorship. So eventually, eventually um, uh, um, John Sachs, who had left, um, uh, um, made me pay more attention to what was going on out there, and the microcomputer era was kind of beginning to happen. Um, uh, you know, the Apple II, uh, um, you know, had, had or, I don't know, I'm not sure timing-wise, oh, Apple sure. one or two, but um, we were looking at processor architectures. The 68000 came out. The, this this uh, thing called the 16032 uh, came out, which was an amazing um, little little uh, computer. It's a shame that it never took off, but it was almost like a VAX on a chip. It was um, uh, extremely just wonderful. And I started to get the itch to um, uh, to want to uh, go be part of the microcomputer uh, revolution. I was working on you know a micronova on my um, you know in that uh, data general project but I wanted to be part of that industry and so um, a recruiter had called me and told me about and uh, about a, a job um, in Cambridge for a company called Software Arts um, and I interviewed there and and took a job um, they uh, that's uh, Dan Brooklyn and Bob Frankson who did VisiCalc and I was an uh, employee number 29 of that company, and uh, they had assigned me, you know, a first job of doing the port of uh, VisiCalc to the um, the TRS-80, the Trash-80. It was uh, it had started out on Apple, and um, uh, this was on the TRS-80, and so I um, I began that project, and it was uh, it was amazing. Um, Software Arts was was incredible. It was the it was the first time I worked for a small company and I loved it um, you know m to in some ways arguably you could say in some ways to their detriment um, they ran it like a family you know that everyone just loved hanging they were decent human beings loved working with each other um, VisiCalc was the most successful uh, software product in the industry at the time um, it was software arts was an engineering only organization the there it, at that time in the in, the early industry it was very common to have publisher um, author publisher relationships so the that there was a company on the west coast called personal software um, that uh, did the publishing of it and software arts was pure engineering product management and engineering and and essentially was compensated with a royalty on every um, uh, every copy that I got sold, um, uh, so this was just a wonderful job. One question: Why um, why did you not go with John Sachs or maybe Peter Mass? But I mean, he was going off to to co-found uh, Lotus. Well, first of all, why? one yeah, no, it's a great question. First of all, the first place he went was actually not Lotus. He started a company with someone else to do. Um, right. to, do, he, to do a spreadsheet for mini computers. Um, he was going to take what was going on in microcomputers and, and uh, go up the stack a little. However, Mitch, he then met Mitch. And uh, the reason that John 
I believe, I, he, he didn't tell me this, but I believe the reason he didn't do this was the core of the product that he created at Data General was three people. And he left, and from, a, from an ethics perspective, I just don't believe he wanted um, to cause that project to fail. The moment I went to <laughs> Software Arts, he called. And he said, I'm, uh, I'm doing this startup with Mitch Kapor. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's called Lotus. They were in the basement of a Franklin Street house uh, at the time. I think there were eight people. Um, and I said, look, I just started at this company working on spreadsheets. Um, he says, well, just stay in touch. So we stayed in touch um, every few weeks. We only worked a block from each other. I was in Cambridge. He was in Cambridge. Um, uh, but, but I loved this company and these people so much. I just wanted to do a startup and I was still having, I was still meeting with my friends and, and, uh, I said, now is the time it's going to be too late. We've got to, we've got to do this, uh, this product. And so Tim and Len said, if you can do a startup, um, if you can get funding, we'll, qu we'll quit our jobs at deck and, uh, um, you know, we'll go, go do that notes thing, um, you know, for microcomputers, which was the, the, the core concept. And then help me with the timing. You had talked about uh, meeting VCs around a different startup idea, something like a mini. When I was still at, Max. when I was still at um, Data General, um, okay. uh, Tim and Len and two other people over there started thinking about doing a startup um, around the National 16032, uh, which was a little vax. And the concept was do a, a VMS-like operating system for this microcomputer. Um, each one of us falls into our own role. Um, I ended up writing the business plan for that. That company was called Microcosm. Um, uh, you know, we would meet at somebody's house, keep developing plans. Um, but eventually that, um, that one fell apart, not because of lack of funding, just because we couldn't get, we just couldn't get momentum among what would have been the founding team. Um, glad we didn't, glad we didn't do that. But that, that taught, that got me into understanding what the, that there were these things called VCs that you write a business plan and that you, uh, you know, bring it to VCs and so on. And so when I was at Software Arts, I began writing the business plan for what would um, uh, eventually, you know, what we wanted to build that would eventually become Lotus Notes. Um, I, you know, took a course, uh, you know, uh, on venture capital. I managed to, at that course, get a couple of contacts. Um, I went and pitched, or sorry, I sent business plans to Greylock, TA, a few of the you know, local Charles River, maybe. Um, uh, at the time, most of them uh, did not ever contact me back. Um, the guy from TA did call me back. And I said, can you just explain to me uh, what's going on? He goes, well, do you have a pencil? Because there's a lot of reasons. You know, number one, um, you're obviously green. You know, you've never um, been in a leadership position before from a business perspective and, and this and that. But, uh, um, but really, we were a little intrigued, except that nobody understood what you were talking about. This concept of connecting people together um, the concept of assuming that there's a PC on every desktop, that's insanity. That's absolute insanity. That, that we have, you know, a seven-year window in our funds, and, you know, that's going to be 30 years from now. So, so um, don't, you know, it, it, it's just, it's too out there. Um, and I really appreciated the, the, uh, the frank feedback, but, you know, it was disheartening. Um, and so I told John Sachs this at lunch at one point, 
And he says, come over and work with Mitch and me. Come over. You know, we're working on this. They were about to ship one, two, three, um, uh, Lotus one, two, three. And again, it was only, I, I think he was the only core developer. They had several other developers working on printer drivers and things. He goes, come join me. Um, I'm burnt out. Um, just come join me. Um, I, I didn't want to, but I, 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 I went over and talked to, he introduced me to Mitch Kapor. Mitch was great. He, he gave me his, his pitch as a visionary and it was, it was tremendous. But I said, I, I just don't want to work on spreadsheets. Like Dan and Bob are great visionaries also. And they, and I'm working on the world's uh, leading spreadsheet. Um, uh, um, he goes, look, just, um, uh, why wouldn't you do it? And uh, tell me what you're excited about. So I told him, the, I gave him the whole pitch about uh, this notes thing. Um, and um, he said, look, I, I, I don't really get it. I, I, re I really don't, I don't get it, but I will commit to you one thing right now. I will commit to you one thing. You come to join us. You del John's burnt out. You come and deliver one, two, three, version two. Um, and, and when that thing ships, I will figure out how to get your thing funded. We'll figure out how to get you funded with what you want to work on. And is that okay? How does that sound? And that was the best deal I had going. You know, the, that was, I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't figure out how to get it funded. So I said, great, terrific. So, you know, Dan and Bob knew I was working on a business plan at the time. This is a slight aggression, but um, um, uh, uh, there was a guy who worked at Software Arts named uh, Tracy Licklider. Um, his dad was J.C.R. Licklider, uh, who had uh, uh, written this seminal, you know, uh, computer, computing as a, computers as a communication, communication device. Um, uh, uh, I told him about it. He got it, you know, but again, it, it was just one person's opinion, not JCR, uh, Tracy. Um, uh, but Dan, did he talk about taking it to his dad? No, 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 no. This is all just socially over lunch kind of thing, you know. Um, and um, Dan and Bob were very, you know, they're, as I said, it was family. They, they, they knew Mitch very well. They knew John. They said, if that's what you want to do, that, that's what you should go do. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, as I said, they were, they were just great, great people. And so I, I went to work for Lotus. And they were not interested in backing you or doing anything related? No, no, no. no I, I, I told them about it, but they were, they were quite immersed. One of the most interesting things that I, I neglected to talk about, about um, my little stint at, at uh, software arts, was the fact that um, so many opportunities cropped up in such a small amount of time. I think I was only there nine months um, from beginning to end, but even right at the beginning, there were some bugs I was trying to fix, and they were bugs not in our product, but in the underlying operating system, which was MS-DOS. So I flew out to Seattle, and I met uh, Bill Gates and Paul Allen. Uh, Microsoft was about 30 people at the time. Um, and uh, that was, I think that was 82. Um, and uh, uh, that was, it was tremendous. They, you know, I taught, I, we got to know each other. They turned me on to the developer who, you know, introduced me to the developer who was doing this stuff and they fixed the bug. Um, uh, about several months later, um, I was working in my office and I started noticing Bob Frankston going into this big closet right across from my cubicle. Um, and he kept going in there and going in there. Then construction people showed up and they were working in there and always the door closed. You know, it was just strange. And then finally these, uh, these suits came in and they brought boxes in to the, the closet. And, and, you know, I was like, what is going on? And, and Bob's like, can't talk about it. Can't talk about it. And one night, it was probably like 10 p.m., um, uh, you know, he came out, it was just us there. And I said, Bob, you've got to tell me what's, what's going on. And so he says, okay, okay, come in here. And I, I went in the closet and there was a big stack of listings, 
a plywood board, uh, a, a PC board attached to a piece of pl uh, plywood and a monitor. And I said, what is this thing? Uh, and he says, this is going to be the IBM PC. Um, and they were one of the early uh, uh, anointed few who would get access to the hardware so that the uh, VisiCal, VisiCal could be on it um, you know, at launch. So it was tremendous, but they were, they were so um, immersed in um, the potential future of both VisiCalc and a new product that uh, they had called TK Solver, which is an equation solver, um, kind of like the next generation of what you would do with numbers, um, that uh, this concept of doing things with words um, uh, was not really um, core. And so, so, so at uh, yeah. So I so I went to work at at Lotus. Um, uh, I worked on site there in Cambridge for two weeks, and I asked Mitch and John, "Do you want me to get the job done, or do you want me to work here in the office in Cambridge?" Because there were just so many distractions. Um, it's a long commute, and there were distractions. So. Uh, Where were you living at the time? Uh, Harvard, Mass., which is about an hour uh, northwest. My wife was an engineer at DAC. Uh, she, on that same team, I met her at those parties at the Rainbow Spa. Um, uh, she was, she, I think at the time, was working at, at Wang Labs, but that was north. And I was, you know, uh, when I met her, I was at, on the west side, so Harvard was a great place to live. But it was still like an hour commute um, into Cambridge. And so um, Mitch said, just do whatever you're going to do to get it done. So I opened an office in uh, a little town called Littleton, Mass. Um, and um, uh, John joined us for the first several months. Um, and uh, there was a small team, a, a team of three people, myself, uh, Barry Spencer, and Matt Stern. And the three of us churned out a quarter of a million lines of assembly language in nine months. Um, it actually shipped nine months to the day after I started. Um, and that product, by that time, had diverged from 123 enough that we called it Lotus Symphony. Um, uh, it had lost macro compatibility with 123. But um, it was. Um, one of the first uh, what you would call sweet products. It brought together word processing, database, and spreadsheets and graphics kind of all in one. Um, and the day that it shipped, um, you know, it was uh, kind of heroics among all of us to get the thing out there. Um, the day that it shipped, literally the day that it shipped, um, Mitch came down. I was in the basement of uh, 161 First Street in Cambridge, uh, Lotus's uh, headquarters at the time. Mitch came down, he shook it, put it, extended his hand, and he said, you did your job. You did exactly what I had asked you to do. Um, and so, uh, so put it away, dust off your business plan, and let's talk about what you want to do and how to get, how to get it funded. Um, there was nothing written down. There was no deal set in stone. There, were lo there was an amazing number of bugs in the queue to be fixed, but he, he lived up to his word without anyone reminding him. Um, and he gave me that opportunity, and it was, it was just tremendous. Yeah. Before we go on mm -hmm. to notes, the um, symphony, I mean, the feature set, the idea of doing the suite, uh, who was driving the, that process? Who's, how did it go from being, yeah. you know, one, two, three, second version to being something much more? Sure. Well, that, that company, um, as many companies since then and till today, um, was shaped around a hacker hustler pair. Um, you know, the uh, um, software arts. Um, had Dan Brooklyn, who was the product manager and the product designer, and Bob Frankson, who was the hacker extraordinaire. He 
you know, he wrote the code. Um, and of course, it's always a negotiation about what can be built or whatever. But the vision, the product vision, and uh, really came out of out of Dan. Um, at Lotus, um, uh, Mitch was was the de facto product manager. He he knew what he wanted. He had worked on spreadsheets before. Um, he was at Personal Software um, at uh, earlier, and he had written a little add-in for VisiCal called Tiny Troll. Um, and that gave him the vision for doing one, two, three, which was, um, uh, you know, three products in, in one. It was kind of a, a mini suite. So he had this vision of where he wanted to take it. At the time, it was not um, just his brilliance. Everyone kind of knew that was the, the, the next direction. Um, and so a company called Ashton Tate um, uh, was building something called Framework. A great individual called Robert, uh, named Robert Carr, uh, was at, at at the core of that, and that was so well architected. It was you know infinitely better architected than the stuff that that, that we were working on. Um, it had a, a a core data model that was very elegant, whereas one two three or one two three and Symphony worked with the spreadsheet as the core data model of all of the, the modules. There was a, a company that was heavily VC funded called Ovation at the time that was threatening uh, to build something that would take over the momentum of 123. So there was a lot of pressure to get it out to market on time. And that was why we kind of raced. And so um, we took very strict roles. Uh, you know, I, they laid out the features. I implemented them the best, uh, the best that I could. It's not that I'm shirking responsibility of all problems that were, you know, in the product, and uh, and and. Uh, but um, uh, that was kind of the the allocation of responsibility. Great. Yeah. Yeah, I would have loved to know, for instance, what, what was the atmosphere like at Microsoft? What, what was it like at uh, Software <laughs> Arts? You know, I mean, let me just give you, let me just give you the, the major things, because maybe you can interpret it from this. So we're just entering notes. Notes, um, it just depends on what your questions are and how many nuances, because that was the longest single segment that was like 13 years of, of life. And... I do, you know, I, I'm not sure how you want to do it. Then, just in quick succession, there's Groove, which is a little bit interesting. It's not hugely interesting, but there's, there's, a, it's a little tiny segment because it's still collaboration and it's a different style of collaboration. Then, it, um, then we head into Microsoft, and I don't know how much. I, I have zero idea how much you want. To talk about Microsoft at all, um, oh, and then definitely do. you know, and and then post Microsoft, there's a startup called Talk. Well, post Microsoft, there's a personal interest thing which will be connected to what I'm working on now, which is the Fukushima, the Safecast thing, which I don't know if we've ever talked about. Um, no, I'm not trying. Yeah, to there's that. there's yeah. Anyway, anyway, then there's. A startup called Taco, which is again collaboration, and then there's the startup that I've got right now, which is Blues. Internet. It was after the Lotus Notes experience that I finally understood enterprise and leadership and the difference between entrepreneurialism and working for a big company, because until that time, I had never really worked for an enterprise. This is still pre-Microsoft, but but um, the, the, the most significant thing, probably, of the notes thing for me personally was understanding the role of collaboration within organizations and the difference between small team and large, uh, large process stuff. Well, you know, you tell me, but Microsoft also seemed, you were obviously bringing your experience with collaboration to that. So, I mean, it all seems of a piece, but you'll, you'll tell me that. The, the, Microsoft, the Microsoft part, um, if you're viewing it from the perspective of 
um, at the macro level perspective as opposed to the um, specific product. My job there was, and I'll say this again, my job was a transformation job, an, or, an organizational transformation job. You know, the, the, you know, even before our company was acquired, I, you know, Bill and Steve told me the goal is we are a PC company, you have to take us beyond what the PC is. And, um, you know, you've done this as an entrepreneur, and here's where we are as a company, you know, go do it. It's, it's, at, the, it's at the change management level. At the product level, um, you know, yeah, I, I built Azure. I seeded the, you know, Office 365 and, and Xbox Live and all that. But that's not the interesting part. I mean, the interesting part to me is um, what they're writing right now about Satya. That was the goal. People were, at the time, Bill and Steve knew that the company was not going to thrive if it was a PC-focused company. And getting it on the right track um, you know, at that moment in time was kind of my job. Um, so anyway, but again, you, we'll get to that. I don't know how much you want to get into that stuff because if, if the whole thing is about collaboration and entrepreneurship. The entrepreneurship thing is mostly we haven't covered, which is having worked in big companies and small companies, um, why do you still go to seek entrepreneurship? Why do you go still seek to build uh, small companies? Um, so. Okay, so talking about um, the beginning of notes. Yeah, um, so kind of in a nutshell, um, Mitch came down and said, dust off your business plans. I, um, I wrote up, I rewrote um, what I had written before. I borrowed a Mac, um, a pre-release Mac. This was 1984 um, from a, uh, uh, one of the groups down the hall who was working on an, uh, a to-be-announced Mac product. And I turned them from character mode to graphical mode and came, you know, did imagery of what what uh, I thought the, the product would, uh, should be like. Um, that was kind of mid-1984. We, uh, uh, we finally reached agreement on an organizational structure by um, December of 1984. It was a, um, I'm not gonna talk extensively about this, but it is notable in one, in one sense. Um, Mitch was an entrepreneur, he started, uh, he started Lotus. Um, the people within Lotus had an inclination of wanting to allow me to do the, do my product as a uh, kind of a subsidiary of of Lotus at the time. Um, I wanted a separate company, and Mitch straddled it. He was in the middle, and he ultimately drove enabled it. Um, to happen the way that I wanted, but it was a fascinating relationship because um, my startup, Iris Associates, had no equity ownership by Lotus. They funded us with an initial check of 1.2 million, but it was an option to purchase rights to the product um, at a future time if they would be willing to commit to marketing it with the full power of, of their marketing organization. Um, at the time we did the, the startup, essentially there was a huge amount of trust involved. They wrote a check and they had, an op they had optionality on something that um, uh, didn't exist. And at the time, if they failed to uh, take advantage of that option, they would have lost rights to it and we could just do whatever we wanted with it. Um, it was a fascinating, um, fascinating deal structure. But in any case, um, uh, uh, December 7th, 84, I called my uh, Tim Halverson and Len Kaywell, very good friends of mine who, you know, 
from college and uh, to today. And uh, uh, I said, I got the check, let's go. And they quit their jobs and uh, they joined me in January. And the three of us uh, set out to, to building um, what eventually would become Lotus Notes. Um, at the time, um, all of us, but Len in particular, um, believed passionately that the PC was going to switch from character mode, which it was at the time, to a graphical user interface. And uh, there was, on the PC platform, the Mac had just been announced um, uh, or launched. I guess that was no November 20th of 84. Um, uh, the Mac was out there. People finally understood, you know, uh, uh, the star and what Park had been working on. Um, but the PC industry, it wasn't um, in the pundits in the PC side of the world did not. It was not a foregone conclusion that graphical user interface was going to uh, dominate because it was so slow and resource intensive, and so on. Um, but I thought so, and Len passionately believed in it. So um, we did a little tour um, trying to figure out what graphical user interface we should bet on, uh, because there were three primaries at the time. One was um, called Vizion, and it was uh, 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 Visicorp, the, the, uh, uh, the company that published Visicalc had renamed itself from personal software to Visi Visicorp, and they, they had a graphical user, user environment. And it was quite mature, and it was reasonably performing given the resources that were there. Um, uh, I stopped in at um, uh, uh, what is it, Pacific Grove, uh, California, to visit Gary Kildall, um, uh, whose company Digital Research, which was well known for CPM at the time, um, they had one um, called Gem, and. Then I went up to Seattle to visit. That was Jim, or, but Jim would have committed you to CPM. Right. That's right. That's right. It, 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 it wasn't clear what Vizion would be. Vizion was going to primarily be um, MS DOS at the time, but um, or PC DOS. Um, yes, Jim. Jim uh, was on CPM eighty six, but I think that they had um, an MS DOS version planned or or whatever PC DOS. And um, I went up to Seattle, and uh, Bill introduced me to his team, who was working on uh, Windows at the time. And it was it was really the poorest choice. Um, it was uh, it was it was technologically uh, not as clearly not as well thought out. It was rushed. Um, there were five people working on it. Um, um, and they were doing the best they could. Um, and, and the best thing you could say about it is that Bill was absolutely committed, absolutely, unquestionably committed that this was the future and this is where it was going to go. Um, not analyzing the psychology, without analyzing the psychology of why he was so committed or whatever, he, it just, it showed. And, and I knew... Why, uh step back why were you so committed and why was he well what did this mean to i was committed because after using the mac which i did during the development steve jobs just stepped back a little i met steve um, back in the the software arts days and um, we had done work when i was at software arts on visicalc for lisa and at one point, Steve had called us to come out there because he was working on this new secret project, uh, flying a pirate flag over the building. And, you know, Mike Boyce, Joanna Hoffman, Annie Hertzfeld, um, Atkinson, they showed us um, the Mac, that, you know, what was going to become the Mac. And, and uh, it was transformational. And he, you know, and, and Steve, of course, was very passionate about that. And Steve wanted... In an era where, where software was either $395 or $495 for one seat, Steve was passionate that it was going to be $99. $99, no piece of software will be more than $99. And so we never did anything um, 
um, you know, on that on that platform when I was there. But it, but because I was at Software Arts and because I was um, at Lotus, where we were working on Jazz as a um, uh, a spreadsheet for the Mac, I ha I was around this platform all the time, and. You know, once you use it, there can be no skepticism. The, 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 the Lisa was pokey. It was very pokey. It was laggy. The Mac was honestly snappier than today's um, PCs. I don't care what you put in, you know, put in it. They, Andy Hertzfeld had done so much work to do everything in one screen retrace. Um, so every everything was just instantaneous in terms of how you um, how you manipulated um, everything and and so I loved it. Len had had done a uh, at DEC a workstation product with Dave Cutler. He had moved with Dave Cutler to Seattle um, and done a thing called Vax Elan, which was a workstation product. Um, and he was passionate about it because he worked on workstations. Tim Halverson had worked on the Vax workstation, a different workstation, um, uh, nascent workstation um, in, May, in New Hampshire. So the bottom line is we all believed in it. Um, the real question was, is the timing right? If we're developing this new product, is the timing right? And so it was a big bet. But I think Bill, in his heart of hearts, um, probably was passionate about it from the competitive angle. You know, he was paranoid. Um, as you should be as a business person. He's very smart. And he could see that the biggest threat to MS-DOS was a graphical user environment that reduced the um, MS-DOS to what uh, Andreessen, I think, called a poorly debugged set of device drivers. You know, he, he had a, he had a, 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 par a healthy par a, you know, paranoia about that. So anyway, um, I essentially told Bill, but I can't, it's the least mature and I have to worry about my app. I can't be worried about your app, um, you know, being stable. And he said, look, um, let's, let's handshake on two things right now. Thing number one is we will develop a runtime version of Windows that you can include with your app. So your app can be graphical independent of whether the OS becomes graphical. So we'll, we'll, we, will, we will develop that for you, you know, um, and, and we'd been talking about it anyway because one of our other early developers would love, you know, would love that also. The second thing is that um, uh, we'll give you the source code and under NDA and ship you new floppies every week, you know, uh, every couple weeks. And you can debug using the source code uh, because there's no doc and it's not done. Um, and to me, that was it. That was the defining, um, you know, the, def the the defining thing. And so, so, um, uh, you know, we we made the choice to work on Windows specifically, um, be, you know, because of source code. We never could have done that had we not been an independent company, because um, they could not allow the source code to get to Lotus. Um, and so the fact that, that I had known Bill before, and that and he didn't know what we were working on. I couldn't tell him about Lotus Notes. Um, uh, but you know, he, he knew me. He, he was very flattering about uh, uh, you know, his belief in, in whatever I was working on. And so we just decided to do that. And that began a, a very fruitful collaboration by which we helped them make a better product um, and a viable product um, as an early developer. Um, and, it, and it was. <laughs> so. And it sounded from the pre-interview like there were, it did create some tension with Lotus, the fact that you were kind of in the middle, right? Well, it didn't create tension in 1985, which was the first full year that we worked on the product. Um, uh, the first full year, uh, we delivered the first floppies, you know, with the product on it 
um, as early as, remember, we started working on it in earnest in January um, of 85. Um, I believe it was May that we had much of the product um, completed because it was three people who were just, we were working 24 seven. Um, and that had, and that was based on an early runtime version of Windows um, that, that we were working on. And they, the people who saw it in there were fascinated by it. But as the year dragged on, at, by the end of 85 and early 86, it was very clear that Microsoft was going to use Windows as a strategic uh, weapon with um, uh, what would become Excel and Word um, uh, against one, two, three, because they're competitors. And uh, so Jim was approached by, Jim Manzi, sorry, the, the CEO of Lotus, was approached by IBM saying, well, we're developing a next generation uh, graphical user interface environment also called OS2. Um, and so suddenly OS2 became strategic to Lotus Whereas Windows was what Lotus actually contractually committed to allowing us to work on. And that's why we worked on it uh, with, um, <laughs> with and, Microsoft. And had you done, because I think you had said in the pre-interview that Mitch had initially wanted to give you guys a stake, just like 10% or something, and have it be really a subsidiary. You couldn't have done this. In that regard. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we had um, because specifically because we didn't do it as an internal spin out or an, an internal business unit. We had complete control and so much control that um, the nature of the contract essentially had a section in it that defined what the product was at the time um, at the, the concept was at the time. Um, but the way it was drafted legally, um, whatever it was, um, we could declare that it was ready for them to make a decision um, and the option was going to be up. We could unilaterally um, state, okay, this is the product. Do you want to, to uh, exercise the option or turn away the option? If they exercised the option, they had to sell what we built. And they had to use best efforts, meaning not just business reasonable efforts, they had to use best efforts, meaning as much as they use on 123, to make the thing a success. Um, and they couldn't kill it. It was written in it that they had to bring it to market. They could not kill it. Um, if they wanted to kill it, if they were hesitant, if they didn't want to use full efforts, then they then the way it was written, they should not exercise the option, at which point they owed us no more money. Uh, we didn't have to return anything and we owned the IP, but that they bought that option. So it was a very tense, increasingly tense relationship as they saw, number one, that what we were developing was against the strategy, the platform strategy of the company. Uh, and it was in alignment with their, their competitors' platform strategy. And number two, um, they didn't know how to sell it. It was very clear, it became clearer and clearer that um, this was a product that needed to be sold to an organization as a solution um, for a collaboration problem that they had. And Lotus's entire go-to-market infrastructure was shrink wrap products sold to computer stores. They had no such thing as a direct sales force or um, they, they had a channel for shrink wrap product. So um, by the time we um, declared that it was ready um, several years down the road, we spent, we spent probably, yeah, we'll get yeah we, we probably spent three years fighting against the memory management um, challenges of operating with a, within the Windows uh, environment um, for the technically minded people who are watching this. Uh, that was a 250K byte working set for both the code and the data. So it was just a struggle to take 
megabytes of code, um, you know, and the operating system itself, and make sure that they ran acceptably in that kind of a working set um, uh, on the IBM PC. Um, but anyway, by that time that we declared that it was ready, Lotus was in a quandary, a, a real quandary as to what to do. And it almost led to a lawsuit and so on. And the settlement was that um, they would bring the Windows version to market if we took a year and also did an OS2 version, and that we would ship both the OS2 and Windows ver versions concurrently and equally. Um, and, um, and, that's, and that's what happened. Before we get definitively to that, um, <laughs> so tell me a little bit about um, Tim and Len, how you came up with the features, how different they were from Plato Notes, and also uh, you, know, you brought up the shrink wrap versus kind of selling to an organization. One thing I wondered is, this is already the era of you know CompuServe's information service, yep. uh, sort of consumer online services. So I'm wondering, you know, you must have thought of that, but I guess there must have been reasons you didn't go in that direction. Well, that was okay. So so during the rewrite of the business plan um, of what would become Lotus Notes and the project plan and so on. Um, it definitely brought up Prodigy and CompuServe, uh, uh, maybe MCI Mail, I'm not sure, um, as um, early um, indicators that email was going to become more of the academic niche, more than the academic niche thing that uh, Multics Mail, Unix Mail, UUNet, um, uh, you know, based UCP-based mail um, was. And that was a core part of the, you know, of, of laying it out. However, um, I very clearly laid it out, mainly because of my, of what I did at Data General. At Data General, I worked on a land-based workstation architecture, um, where there were file servers, print servers, and intelligent workstations. I believed passionately that that was going to be the architecture, in every major organization worldwide. Um, you know, Ethernet, uh, you know, IBM was behind Token Ring. There was this other thing called SciTech, uh, which was a, 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 a token passing bus, um, uh, and Ethernet was there. And so all of the signs showed that that was going to be the architecture of deployment within um, enterprises. And so fu the fundamental product definition was email and discussions and and address book and certain things like that when i when i drew when i wrote up the plans you could conceptualize it as a um sweet product for communications it had discussions mail contacts calendars and so on but it looked like a sweet product once we started working on it um, uh, the, the different roles, um, uh, Tim was a very deep um, database, uh, database and systems type implementer. He's a very good architect. You know, as I said, he worked directly for Dave Kotler and um, they, he learned a lot from that and that, that was uh, uh, that was his core strength. Um, Len was the one who was operating at the graphical user env environment level. He was the closest to the user. Um, I had a role that was that spanned both of those, meaning some infrastructure and some UI. But I was the one who was trying to envision with the customer what they were also trying to do. So I implemented this thing that today we call a NoSQL database. It was a, I, I did a bunch of dabbling around in what databases should be done, but I implemented um, that layer. Tim built an indexing layer on it that, would, that could be used to drive the UI and so on. We operated as an amazing you know, uh, collaborative set of folks. Um, it was very clear, maybe six months on, 
that in order to make it operate in a distributed uh, manner, we needed to take the concept of synchronization and replication much more seriously. So we hired another guy, Steve Beckhart, who um, uh, dealt with the, the uh, replication of the NoSQL database that I had uh, done. Um, security had to be a part of it because it needed to be distributed security. So we brought in this guy named Al Eldridge, and we can talk about security, but that's a very extensive thing. We were the first um, uh, implementers of public key cryptography in a mass market uh, product, and, and so he brought you know he brought that uh, knowledge in. But anyway, it was an it was an amazing core team of five that that built um, the majority of it um, uh, you know during that that period of time. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I lost. I lost. No, no, I'm, that's perfect. Talking about the roles of the people, mm -hmm. um, but I'm I'm still a little. So I mean, all this makes sense for an organization or a company, but why wouldn't it also, I mean, make sense working with someone like CompuServe or some, you know, something with a more uh, Cut, so comp to a network, and you have a consumer product as well, or, or more like later MSN. First of all, there was no concept of a consumer product for this, uh, for this product. The product at its core was about um, people working together in an organization to get things done together. Um, uh, that, was the, that was the core mission. It wasn't about um, consumer email or things like that. People were using dial-up at the time. This would require a faster network. Oh, there was no such network. thing as All a faster right. network. Yeah, there's no, there was no such thing as a fast network. You know, at that time, there, this was all pre-internet. Um, uh, you know, and so, so uh, you know, that, that was at the core. The biggest single design decision, I, you know, I will, I'll, again, I'm, you don't forget these things. Um, the riskiest, biggest design decision was I had envisioned it as more or less initially a suite of standalone communication tools that were woven together into the same UI. Um, as we developed the database more, the possibility became the, it, it became a possibility that you could actually um, develop it as a generalized tool and build those applications as as modules on the same underlying database. And if you did that, they would all replicate the same way. They would all, you know, it was a very coherent architecture. And so w there was a very big transition where we decided we were going to make it an application development platform as much as um, having those core applications. And that was, it turned out that that was determinative of the product success, you know, over, over time because um, and we can talk about this more. This was post-release, but really the strength of Notes ended up being around the business processes and practices that it automated, not merely around communications. So. That's the flexibility that yeah. gave you the flexibility to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at the time, just 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 to. Um, just to uh, put a little end cap on the consumer thing, we were incredibly fascinated and had good ties with, um, there's a guy named Tom Jennings who had a, who built a system called Fido. Um, and it was a, uh, it was, you know, the common man's bulletin board system, um, uh, you know, that was trying to com compete with the man who was CompuServe, uh, Prodigy, and so on. And it was amazing. It was wonderful. Um, uh, and, and we took many of the concepts as validating the fact that this, this core notion of messaging and bulletin boards was a, you know, a, an essential element to almost anything that we did. We saw it on Plato, but again, now it was happening in another environment. But it's true. If you if you wanted the speed of a PC with a network card and a yeah, yeah. 
There's yeah. only one way to go at the time. That's right. That's right. And the and then talk just so Tim and Len are such important figures here. Say a little bit about them as people and kind of your yeah, relationship. So Tim and Len, who we who I've talked about um, uh, uh, a few minutes ago, um, Tim and Len were more than uh, collaborators uh, or uh, important figures. Um, uh, Tim Halverson, Len Kaywell, and I uh, were essentially peers and equals um, in the creation of this uh, of this product and this opportunity. Um, uh, just like in a marriage, you're brought together for a common purpose. You choose to be together. Uh, you're different and you do different things, um, but you are brought together by common beliefs and whatever. Tim and Len and I are different people who have different skills, um, who had a common belief that was brought together because of the vision that we saw in Plato. And um, Len is a more right-brained thinker uh, uh, who thinks about uh, people and experience and interaction design. Uh, Tim is a more left-brained um, um, uh, engineer. He's an engineer's engineer who uh, is deep into architecture. And I am more of uh, uh, a solution-focused person. I, you know, we're all good engineers, but I, I brought the fundraising to it. I was thinking about how are we going to get this in, in the hands of, of, of actual users and people. I managed the relationship uh, with Lotus. But each one of us probably wrote, of the initial three million lines of code that was Lotus Notes, we each probably wrote a million-ish lines of code. Um, this is you know C by this point in time um, ourselves. And the areas of the product um, that over time I gravitated toward were, um, you know, uh, you know, more salute. How do you build an app? Uh, the things that Len did was usability related. You know, is is this thing going to be usable by human beings? And Len and Tim was more. How can we make it perform and, and operate within the operating environment um, uh, that is there? But um, there would be no Lotus Notes uh, without Tim Halverson, Len Kaywell, and I, and, and also Stephen Beckart, who uh, did the, um, the replication, and Alan Eldridge, um, who was uh, on the security side. Those were all ultimately core elements uh, uh, to our success. And did you guys hang out together as well? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, we hung out in, in college uh, when we were uh, associated with the Plato Project. And uh, we hung out, um, you know, as I said, at, uh, at when they were at DEC and I, I was at uh, Data General. Um, when, by the time we uh, founded the company, each one of us uh, had become married. I had a uh, uh, I had one child at the time, um, our first, and uh, it was, life was a little bit more complicated in terms of when we hang out together. It was more the families getting together and, and things like that. Um, my Tim's girlfriend at the time had introduced me to my girlfriend at the t you know who became my girlfriend and my wife, uh, um, and we've been married for what is it? 37 years now. <laughs> Ever since. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And so you really ran the company kind of, I mean, it was, in we ran the company collaboratively and fell into our patterns. You know, Stephen Beckhart, uh, he enjoyed fi the finance aspects, you know, of, of uh, finance and operations aspects. Um, I, as I said, dealt with the product management aspects of dealing with uh, Lotus and ultimately the go-to-market aspects, all the legal aspects of our relationship. Um, um, you know, Len, as I said, from a human interface perspective, he dealt with all the test and uh, usability um, uh, 
aspects of it and so on. And you had talked about on um, pre-interview, Ben Rosen and funding. Um, could you talk a little bit about? Well, Ben Rosen, ben Rosen was one of the um, key, he was pro a very prominent venture capitalist at the time, and he was the key uh, 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 funding source for Lotus. Uh, and Lotus, um, I'm not sure how much you are aware of the early, the, the early days of Lotus, but um, the initial um, funding plan, I believe, for Lotus was that it was going to sell three to five million dollars worth of product in its first year, and it sold 53 million um, in its first year. It was it took off like a rocket, and by the time uh, Mitch and I uh, were began talking about um, me doing this uh, startup, Lotus was flush with cash. I mean, they were they were they were investing, but they were also significantly profitable. So um, uh, I didn't have to go to a VC. They, they, uh, Lotus was funding it out of its operational um, earnings. I thought you had talked, so maybe I misunderstood. I thought you had talked about Ben Rosen having some role no. uh, around Iris. No, 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 no. Okay. No, the, on, the only funding for Iris came from uh, f funding related to the option agreement that, that we had in place. Uh, okay. And that, that was before the option. Then at, at a certain point, they exercised the option. And as a part of the operational agreement between us, post option exercise, they paid all of our costs. Um, there were no profits um, until there were ultimately royalties. We got paid royalties on gross of, of, um, of the actual Lotus Nose product. But our operational expenses were were born by Lotus. And that was done so that we would organize activities between Iris and Lotus as they would make sense to, for the best product and the best experience. If, uh, and we would make those decisions in a neutral, neutral manner. So, I mean, Iris, I mean, it was a separate corporation. That's right. Effectively, it's such a unique status. I mean, you had a board of your own. Uh, there was no board. It was a, at the time, I believe it was a sub S corporation. Um, and Len, Tim, and I, I believe the top five people were probably the only shareholders. But um, the actual shareholders didn't, wasn't really a material thing because even when royalties came in, we shared the royalties in more of a partnership type of style where um, uh, it didn't really. We we pass around earnings in a way that matched contribution within the company as opposed to um, equity. And the and the it was an amazing it was an amazing partnership. Uh, Iris lasted for uh, ten years. Ultimately, um, the royalties that Lotus paid us uh, became too burdensome because they had to invest in the business. Um, and so, uh, essentially, uh, the only real way of solving it was for Lotus to buy us, eliminate the royalty stream, and give us equity, you know, to, uh, and we became part of Lotus. Little did we know at the time, though, that um, IBM, who was going through a restructuring of their own um, internally under their new CEO, uh, Lou Gerstner, um, they had been looking at Lotus because at at Notes because Notes was the first of a of what ultimately became many um, products that uh, could be sold to an enterprise and sold with professional services, um, and they viewed that it could be a pivotal asset. Um, they had thought about buying Lotus earlier on for Notes, but they found out about this complicated relationship between, between Iris and Lotus. So they had just stayed, stayed by, uh, uh, stood by. Um, when Lotus bought Iris, they, they reinitiated, um, a guy by the name of Frank King reinitiated the, uh, the concept internally. 
and they just said, we're going to buy this company. And so they made an overture to Lotus uh, sometime in um, early, um, early 2000 and, sorry, 2000, 1995. And, I, and uh, Lotus, uh, you know, Jim famously at the time said, Lou, uh, they had dinner and he said, you know, Lou said, I'd like to buy your company. He says, why don't you buy me dinner instead? And um, uh, uh, about a week later, there was a hostile takeover uh, uh, made of Lotus by IBM uh, that ended up getting consummated for three and a half billion, which at the time was actually a lot of money. <laughs> um, but the no one at Lotus or Iris realized that when when you formally were bought by Lotus, that it would trigger this. Oh, not a clue. I mean, no, no way to not just a not black a clue. Swan. No, no. <laughs> we were we were coping. Lotus was in kind of a, in trouble at the time because they were coping with the decline of the desktop business. Um, uh, the, there was now real competition with Excel. Um, uh, the market was kind of stabilizing. You know, it it, it hadn't reached. Uh, its peak yet, but there, the, the early days of growth were, uh, the growth rate was shrinking and um, Notes was taking significant cash because uh, it was a new go-to-market model. There was a lot of market development, both in terms of building up a partner ecosystem for the product and um, uh, a direct sales force. Um, I should say that this was a period of education for me. Um, uh, I had never sold products to enterprises. Uh, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Larry Moore um, who came in and made some, took some very strong positions with Manzi about um, how the product was going to fail if it was marketed um, per seat and as a desktop product and it needed a solution sales force and you needed to raise the price. So we raised the price to $62,500 for 200 seats, and he sold it with a solution sales force. But that's what helped it catch on. And, and um, you know, the, the, the two people on the go-to-market side that were instrumental in its, in its taking off were Larry Moore and a gentleman at uh, Price Waterhouse uh, named uh, uh, Sheldon Laub who um, bet his, kind of bet his career on making a big, uh, a big deal at our product launch of buying a million dollars worth of Lotus Notes to transform Price Waterhouse um, at the time. It was uh, tremendous. But it was only at that time um, and that period um, when I actually started to understand the enterprise and how it was being deployed. And it was only around that time that I started to meet people like we had hired Irene Greif. Irene Greif is a, was an academic at um, MIT who coined the term computer-supported cooperative work. Um, she, she was uh, very, very instrumental early on in coalescing the academic community around uh, uh, the importance of what the category at the time was referred to as groupware. There was a, a, a gentleman at MIT named Tom Malone who had written a very influential paper on coordination theory um, that brought the, um, uh, brought the importance of notes um, uh, and the category around notes um, uh, up because his pitch was that you have to look at the macroeconomic impact of these products on a corporation. These were not just little products that let people talk. This lets you redefine your business process by looking at the coordination flows within an organization and you know, using the technology to act as a superconductor to make the, the number of iterations or the fidelity of the inter uh, interactions among people within an organization um, much higher. Um, it was a, it was a tremendous, tremendous era. You know, at that point in time, you know, I started paying more attention to, uh, I think it was Oliver Williamson, uh, 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 
uh, wrote a, a, a pretty defining paper on transaction cost economics. And uh, transaction econo cost economics went back to Ron Coase, uh, his work in the 30s. Um, very, um, um, it, it, it gave us a new way of explaining what this was that, uh, that we were pitching and why it was important. Um, at the same time, um, so, so just for those who aren't familiar, um, uh, Lotus Notes at its core was two things, email and an application development platform that let you build things like discussions and um, workflows that were very key to a certain uh, application of the product. So if you, if you put it in an audit firm, they would build an application where auditors would collaborate with one another and they would shape the application to have fields that were relevant to auditors. Salespeople would use it in Salesforce automation, um, which wasn't a term at the time, or CRM. They would build CRM systems um, on it. One of our early resellers built a great CRM system. Uh, his name was Mark Cuban. Um, um, uh, uh, there were all sorts of small businesses that were growing up as an ecosystem around notes, customizing it for different companies. So it was really taking off in the global 2000. At the same time, there was this little company, Microsoft, who came in and said, oh, we're going to compete with this thing. And they came out the, with Microsoft Exchange. And Microsoft Exchange had a public folders function. So they came, we pitched our product as um, groupware and email for the net. Um, Microsoft pitched theirs as email and groupware for the net, you know. Um, uh, but suddenly there was a head to head competition. And suddenly our sales skyrocketed because once the market saw that there were two people who were essentially telling the same story, um, then everything was a battle between one or the other, and, and it benefited both of us. We ended up taking what the- year approximately? Um, what year was that? 95, 96, 90, uh, yeah, 97, uh, somewhere in that 19. realm. And you had said um, before that the, you, IBM had the bigger clients and Microsoft had the smaller ones, is that? That's right. The, the, the two ends of the market. That, that's right. The, the way that it ended up working out, <coughs> excuse me, the way that it ended up, I got to take a break for a sec. Sure. <coughs> 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 you want to take a moment? That's no, fine. that's fine. So the way it, that the competition between us, which was great, ended up, um, Microsoft, because it had a, a, a tremendously broad channel infrastructure, ended up succeeding in the mid-market, small to medium-sized businesses. <clears throat> um, there were, you know, the, the average um, exchange organization probably had 250 seats, uh, 250 users connected to it, whereas um, notes came in enterprise down, and so we had most of the global 2000 enterprises and we had very little presence in the low to mid uh, part of the market um, but it was great i mean we were both we were both making tremendous tremendous progress how with ibm it had some huge number of users once they bought it, over 100 million something like I think when I left, ultimately left IBM, uh, which was 97, it was roughly 125 million um, users. And these are, these are you know, users within enterprises. And there were server sales and, and things like that. And going, stepping back, when, when did Notes first get actually sold to customers? It was what year? We launched and our first sale was on December 7th of 89. It was five years to the day after we had, uh, I had spun out of, uh, I signed my contract with Lotus. Um, as I said, the first three years of that was hard software engineering. The, the uh, 
fourth year was uh, getting OS2 up and running, and the fifth year was really the getting ready with a go-to-market. And um, it, it had a slow growth um, at the beginning, and it was probably only 92, 1992 or 1993 that it really, there was an inflection point in the curve. V3 of and notes. early on, and who were the main competitors early on? The only, the only, there were no real competitors um, in the, until Exchange came out. And when Exchange came out, Exchange was the only competitor. Uh, pre, I, pre, um, before IBM bought us, IBM threatened us and tried to fud the market with something called Office Vision or OV LAN, a LAN version, a non-mainframe version of an office automation system. But, um, Really, we were alone in the market, and the our biggest uh, challenges were developing the solution sales, how to explain what you're selling to a customer in a way that's relevant. And I know this is um, very mundane, but um, getting lands pulled inside of organizations was extremely painful. Um, New York and Chicago were particular challenges because unions prohibited people from drilling holes in their walls. So um, uh, you had to have unions do that. And it was a very expensive, getting a, you know, I, I'll never forget one of our best early customers was Merrill Lynch. And Merrill just struggled. It, it deployed, the, it delayed their deployment by over a year just getting the LAN cable pulled um, within the organizations. I mean, you could run over several different <clears throat> lands, but by the time... But they all required so I... wires. They all, they, sure, sure. They, <laughs> yeah. they, they all, at the time, they all required you to pull a coax um, uh, through a wall. Um, there was no real viable twisted pair um, infrastructure at the time, and um, it was tough. And, and for the email portion, I mean, by the end of the 80s, there were a number of, I mean, Novell and various others, and some, I mean, MCI, there are various sorts of email. That's right. But so what your pitch was, it was well, email plus this environment that you could do your own custom applications, in essence. The, that was the core of the pitch. Um, uh, we knew just because we're computer scientists, we knew that the client server architecture of, of email was more secure than the um, other predominant way. And I know this is hard for people to believe, but the predominant uh, product at the time was not phone based email. It was in business, it was. Um, either mainframe based email like Vaxmail, um, if you already had a, a mainframe you know, in your company, um, or a land based email, predominantly CC mail. And CC mail um, had a file server, and the client would open that file, uh, that shared file, and write its stuff into it. So any email client. Could, op could open it up and write garbage to the file and completely overwrite the company's mail. But it was cooperatively, you know, you don't do that. You get fired if you do that. <laughs> so um, there was no security, you know, uh, um, to speak of um, and, and no assurance of service. So we knew that client server mail, where you run a server and have protocols that send stuff, um, and in our case, with encryption, um, we knew that was the right architecture, but it was much more resource intent intensive than CC mail, which still ran in character mode um, on on most laptops. Uh, I'm sorry, PCs. Ultimately, Lotus bought CC mail and folded it in, and it became part of the our, the, the Lotus communication suite. And we developed very good interoperability between CC Mail and Notes, so that became a you know a very good sale. Security was a main selling point. Yeah, obviously. yeah, yeah. And I mean, you had worked with RSA, I think. 
Right. When we, when I initially was working on the specs, the um, late summer of of 1984, uh, before I spun out, um, I was grappling with how am I going to do security in a distributed environment. Um, my the data flow was modeled against. Uh, a very popular system at the time, uh, UUCP, which was the way that uh, in the Unix community, news groups and discussion forums were replicated in a very broad, wide area way. One server would use dial-up, tel you know, telephones to dial up store and forward. another one and do store and forward. And that, because there was no internet, that was the way things, you know, that the way things worked. Um, so, or there wasn't ubiquitous internet commercially. So, um, so we modeled it in a dial-up model like that. You would have a note server that had a modem on it, um, but how do you have any assurance of security? There was no Unix operating system or distributed way of, uh, of assuring security. So I had read a, an article in the, when I was in the Lotus Library, I, there was a, a journal called Dr. Dobbs uh, Journal, um, and I read an article in it about this um, paper, this uh, paper on public key cryptography, uh, written by uh, Diffie Hellman, Diff, you know, Whit Diffie and and, and Marty Hellman, and um, I'm yep, and um, uh, they wrote about this new algorithm RSA, uh, you know, that 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 had come out and essentially in Dr. Dobbs, they printed the Fortran source code of a sample app um, that did uh, public key cryptography. And it took minutes to generate, you know, uh, to do a public key operation, um, you know, in Fortran on a, on a 286-based PC. But it worked. And I said, well, this is it. This is the, this is the solution. So when I had the solution, I put it in the back of my mind. It, I wrote it in the like, business plan at, before we got funding, and that was it. Um, then in late summer, when we finally uh, got to the point where we needed to start working on it, the summer of 85, um, by that time, Ron Rivest had written a letter to Mitch Kapor, just out of the blue, uh, introducing uh, himself and saying that he and a guy named Jim Bidzos were starting a company, uh, uh, RSA Data Security, and uh, uh, they'd like to have a meeting and pitch him, you know, on one, two, three, using it or something. Mitch just forwarded it to me, saying, "Do you know? Do you understand any of this stuff?" Um, and so I took the meeting, and it was it was a match made in heaven. I already knew what he was working on. And we agreed right then and there that they would, um, that we would be their customer, that they, we would figure out a contract and they would write a toolkit um, that would do both a symmetric algorithm and an a, and a, a RSA and an asymmetric, uh, uh, sorry, an asymmetric algorithm, RSA, and a symmetric algorithm, de DES. Um, and we would start using that um, uh, in our product, you know, DES for the bulk data, and uh, RSA to sign and, and encrypt the keys, or whatever, you, you understand. So, um, so uh, um, we did the contract, they built the toolkit, and so on. And that was what, um, what we used all the way until we were in beta test in 86. And, um, uh, the lawyers told us, the Lotus lawyers told us that um, we would need an export license um, to ship this thing outside the U.S. because it was a munition. I didn't know this. Um, so I went with the lawyer to D.C. to meet with a, a, uh, an organization called the BXA, Bureau of Export Ad Administration or something. Uh, in reality, they were NSA um, employees, and uh, we talked about shipping this mass market product. And they were like fascinated and humored at the same time by the by the whole concept of actually doing this. So within a month or so, they um, 
uh, they gave us their proposal, and the proposal had two, it was essentially a bunch of small points, but there were two important points. Number one, um, you cannot export DES. That is absolutely forbidden, we'll never allow it. There's no negotiation, that's it. And number two, um, uh, when you do have an algorithm, it will have a maximum key width. They said uh, an RSA key width, I forget what the RSA key width was, but of the symmetric algorithm, they said, uh, regardless of algorithm, it'll have a maximum key, key width of 20 bits. And um, so we were very frustrated. We went back to Ron, and essentially it became a, uh, a negotiation where Ron Rivest gave us, armed us with what to say next, and we would meet with the NSA people and, and talk with them about it. Um, eventually, where it came to was Ron had to implement a DES replacement for us, so he, he implemented two algorithms for us, RC5 and RC4, one to be used for um, storage of notes on disk, for disk-based storage, that was the RC5, and RC4 was the transport encryption, um, you know, fast as an XOR um, over, you know, over the wire. Um, and that was acceptable. We got them up from 20 bits to 32 bits. And when we shipped Lotus Notes V1, um, it had 32-bit encryption, like really powerful. <laughs> um, but it only shipped in the US. Several months later, we did an incredible amount of engineering work and um, uh, we began to split the keys to, so that we could have a different uh, key width for what was exported versus what was imported. And only months after our V1, we shipped that version and we went up to 64 bits uh, domestically and we got them you know, to go up to 40 bits um, abroad. And so if you had a collaborative group, um, the product without any user interface changes would detect the key, uh, the key ring and the info in the, uh, the directory about users and it would send the things abroad at, with the lower encryption and the domestic ones um, uh, encrypted higher. Very complicated. I testified before Congress um, uh, because of this with Phil Zimmerman uh, and, and, and some others. Spent an immense amount of time um, in there. Uh, uh, was on a National Research Council um, uh, study to try to make recommendations. Uh, uh, we came out with this crisis report, uh, um, you know, that, that uh, uh, was supposed to help change legislation and ultimately Clinton uh, uh, relaxed the export so that we could do um, uh, the same 64 bits abroad that we did domestically. For writing to disk, you could use that was well. We used this. We stayed with separating the algorithms because of computational uh, um, requirements. It was. It's still way less computationally intensive to have a transport of the of RC4 um, versus uh, the on the message encryption. Uh, you know, in the local store um, uh, where we used RC5. And I was very proud of Notes. Notes had, you know, people don't, right now it's very popular to talk about end-to-end -end, um, encryption. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that in that era, even though people didn't realize the value of it, um, every user had a key ring, um, you know, stored on your PC that was generated um, uh, when you became a notes user. It wasn't even stored in a central directory. That, um, you know, that key ring was encrypted uh, as a derived function of the, of the password when you ran the product. And, you, and all your keys, you know, your private keys and, and, and things were in there. We had a, a certificate infrastructure. We had K of N um, certifiers so that uh, the organizational certifiers, you never had one person who had access to generating keys for an organization 
uh, and could undermine the security of the whole thing. Um, the, the only people who appreciated our end-to-end -end encryption were uh, our government customers. Department of State was a huge user of it. Um, maybe they still are, I don't know, because essentially all the embassies um, uh, ran and had their own servers and they wanted to make it so that the server admins of the communication infrastructure could not read the messages that were being composed by ambassadors. So it was a, um, it was, it, the encryption infrastructure was something that, that, that uh, I think was quite significant. And um, how about banking customers did you have, or finance, they were not? We had we had some we had some finance customers, but the um, we didn't have huge penetration because the uh, regulatory requirements required archiving that was easier to do in a centralized manner than in a decentralized manner, and so they tended to be late adopters of decentralized technologies. I think arguably they skipped it, um, you know, and and. All of their mail, chat, everything, you know, ended up being centralized so they could log it all. I mean, by the time you actually launched the product, it was really the height of the client server craze. Yeah, and so it it it, it, it helped. Yeah, it kind of helped fuel that 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 craze. Microsoft, even though they competed with us, they loved us because um, the Windows client and the NT. Um, the nascent Windows NT server was the sweet spot of everything that we shipped. So um, we were out there helping push NT servers, um, you know, and everyone was beginning to catch on that, that the NT server file, for file service, uh, print service, and database service was the, you know, the architecture of the future. And when you started with Microsoft, obviously they were working on Windows 1.0, right? But by the time... When I started working with Microsoft, yeah. yeah, when I was working with Microsoft, they were starting with Windows 1.0. By the time, you know, in the middle of Notes development, they were co-developing OS 2. Then that relationship soured, and they began working on NT. Then, um, <laughs> then because I know Dave, and and, uh, and stuff, they started sending us the source code for for NT, so we could start getting that server. They didn't want us to make OS two server the default server, you know, of choice. Um, so we had a very good collaborative relationship with Microsoft, um, you know, on the on the server side of the world. Yeah. When you first released, it was still under DOS. On the when, when we released, it was a DOS. Um, on the original floppies, it was a DOS client set of floppies, an OS2 client set of floppies, a, an OS2 server set of floppies, and an NT server set of floppies. So. <laughs> but the client was, yeah, I mean, because what, even Windows 3.0 was still that's 91 right. or something. That's right. And we shipped, and there was a, right, and there was a Windows set of floppies. You would install the Windows floppies, then you would install the Notes floppies, you know, and, and, and so on. Um, uh, and I think in the V1, you might have even had a TCP floppy. Um, and optional if you wanted to use TCP in your organization. That was kind of nascent um, at the time. Um, um, but anyway, um, kind of moving, moving forward with this, um, uh, we were sold to IBM. IBM did amazing things uh, with it over the, and I stuck around for two years. And I began to get itchy. As I said, I was beginning to learn more about um, about the different um, social and organizational mechanics that drove successful installations and um, failed installations of the, um, of the product. And uh, some of what was most exciting to me 
was um, that there was a real divide. There were um, organizational processes that um, drove the deployment of notes like a supply chain infrastructure. And there were some people who were trying to use it in a dynamic collaboration um, viewpoint where you would have a small group who was trying to develop a product. So they wanted to get the engineers together and collaborate with the product managers and maybe people in different facilities. Um, the, 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 they, it was almost as though they were two different products that were satisfied by one infrastructure. But the IBM was pushing it more and more and more in the direction of satisfying the, the enterprise scenarios, the large scale coordination, global Salesforce automation, and so on. So I um, had a product concept, um, started thinking about it in 96. I spun out in 97 to do a new startup uh, called Groove. Um, and Groove's core mission was uh, to leverage the internet, which was like a real thing by that point in time, um, to uh, enable people to do the best dynamic collaboration that they possibly could. Um, you know, people, uh, people coordinating in a very loose way, um, people from different organizations. If you had a job to do and you knew the people to do it, you could get them to form a group very quickly, select the right tools to do it. I need a files, a shared files tool. I need shared discussion. I need chat. I need a calendar to assemble those tools, do it, and then vaporize um, the collaborative environment. Um, this, we made a very fundamental core bet early on, and I realize this is a deeply technical statement, so, uh, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, we made a bet on the internet, but we did not bet on the web. Um, people conflate the two right now, but at the time, it was hard for me to believe that in global, that global organizations or multiple organizations would actually trust the internet to hold their entire directories and contact information. Like the concept of something like Salesforce um, was, and SaaS in general, I just did not believe it. I just, I could not believe that was the core asset of a company. Um, how could they trust that to another company? But the, the, the global transport, I was a big believer in, and there was, this was the Napster era, you know? Um, peer to peer. You bet on the internet, not the web. That's right, I bet on peer to peer. Peer to peer was, was the way that this, <laughs> this thing was gonna go. So, how do you get a bunch of people to collaborate peer to peer uh, without a central server? And how do you have the tools synchronize their uh, discussion documents, their files, all of that in a peer to peer fa fashion? You've got a dozen people who are working with one another, but there's no server. How does this work? And they're not even online all the, uh, at the same time. So how, so how if you're gonna do this dynamic collaboration, do you, do you securely um, get connections among all the participants and how do you synchronize the data amongst all these participants? In essence, um, it's a problem of more or less global consensus. How, how do you get consensus that this version of the file you know, is the same as that or this, this message that you sent uh, arrived in that order, you know, allowing deletions and all that? So what we built was a, this is 1997, a distributed ledger system uh, um, uh, with cryptographically signed transactions um, uh, that were essentially broadcast, um, encrypted and broadcast among the participants with a Lampert's clock type uh, identity uh, identifier scheme for global ordering so that essentially um, every, every node was secure. As a matter of fact, by, by encrypting it and inserting it into this transaction log, which today we would call blockchain, um, 
uh, you know, you would you would know the identity and uh, you would have the ordering. So this thing was, it was amazing. It it um, it it took quite a bit of time to get it right. About three years um, uh, to get it right, and uh, we came to market with it as a you know peer collaboration tool. Probably sometime in in the year two thousand. Um, but where where did the idea come from for the ledger approach? Uh, a whiteboard. <laughs> um, no, the the what we started the company with um, was the concept of dynamic and collaboration. As well, by the way. Very very good very good question. Um, uh, the two the the. The primary technical co-founder uh, uh, is Eric Patey. Um, he was, you know, primarily the architect of the overall uh, system and overall environment. Um, I would say uh, uh, the the people involved in the distributed ledger aspect of it uh, were my brother Jack Ozzy, uh, who was working for me uh, at the time. Uh, he was also at Iris. Uh, he, you know, came in a little. Um, I didn't mention that. Okay. Yeah, he came in like in the middle of Iris. Um, well, he, he was actually pretty early. He was probably in the twenty-five employee number twenty-five or twenty-six. Um, uh, worked on um, much of the surrounding infrastructure that made it necessary for notes to connect into other systems. Um, but he was one of the co-founders of uh, of Groove. Uh, as was Eric, um, uh, but there was another uh, uh, gentleman by the name of Ransom Richardson, who was a very uh, strong engineer, um, and uh, he had a very good understanding of the tri cryptographic um, elements uh, of what was necessary. So amongst us, kind of as the core group, um, uh, uh, we generated the um, Kind of the ideas that led to the, um, the the log. There were multiple ways of synchronizing that we entertained um, from computer science because uh, um, there are there are just different ways of dealing with it. But a distributed transaction log uh, based on signed uh, transaction and global consensus around that um, seemed to be the best. Uh, the best alternative, um, and essentially what you what what Groove was, if you called it today, it's a D app. You know, it's a it's a distributed app based on a common blockchain, and all the apps in it were built on this: the directory uh, of users and their certificates, the uh, you know everything that was necessary to build that infrastructure up um, was good, and it was a it it, it just a very strong group of engineers who uh, who brought it up. Um, unfortunately, whoop, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that if you could talk a little bit also about the sort of business story there, I mean, you know, who funded it? Who was the board? What was, um, I mean, by this time you were a successful entrepreneur leaving uh, IBM at that point, yep. right? Yes. Um, and why? Why did not uh, some of the people you'd worked with in the past, or they had gone on to do other things? Or so. I mean, tell a bit of the, you know, where did it come from? What's the business story? Well, the um, IBM didn't want me to leave, and they basically said you can have a blank check to work on your next project within IBM. And I said, but I'm an entrepreneur. I've worked for big companies, and I've worked for small companies. Um, now. Um, each one has its own unique character. For example, um, within a, a large company, you have immense distribution, um, uh, but it's extremely difficult technologically to build a product because as you're trying to build the product, you have all sorts of people coming in from the woodwork saying, does it comply with this architecture? Is it compatible with this? Because ultimately, they're going to have to sell it and if it looks like it isn't con coherent and consistent with the rest of the organization, it's not just needless bureaucracy, it's necessary bureaucracy, um, but, that, but they have distribution um, and resources. On the other hand, um, 
uh, as an entrepreneur, you have infinite flexibility. It's, it's wonderful. It's like a new baby. It could be anything. It, it could be infinitely successful. Um, um, uh, you have all this flexibility. You have a great team to work with, unconstrained. But distribution is horrible. It's just immensely difficult to uh, get the flywheel turning. Um, they both got their trade-offs. But for this one, I wanted, I knew that notes would always be the thing that I was competing with internally because notes was the answer to all collaboration um, uh, within the, the company and within that market. And I was trying to pick off a niche and do a better job than notes did in the dynamic collaboration niche. Um, so I went, uh, I went the independent way. I seated it myself. Um, uh, for the first uh, uh, period of time. Um, uh, I then uh, decided to take uh, VC, and I knew a bunch of people on the West Coast, and uh, we took money from, um, well, I'll say number one, Mitch Kapor, uh, who invested again. Mitch was, has always been a a supporter, you know, I, I, I never could have done anything. There would have been no notes um, if it wasn't for Mitch and if Mitch didn't blast through the bureaucracy of, uh, of his own organization uh, to make it happen. Um, uh, but he, he supported me in that. Um, uh, Mitch introduced me to uh, an organization that I already knew some people in, but uh, he was very close to at the time, which is Excel. Um, uh, and so Excel became the lead of, a, of the, the first round after the first seed where I had seeded it. I participated in that one and it was Excel. The next round, um, uh, it was supported by Intel Capital. Um, Intel liked it because they liked peer-to-peer. -peer. They saw more PCs, more, more computers at the edge, so they liked it. And uh, Microsoft, um, Bill, uh, I know Bill pretty well, and uh, Bill was has always been a supporter, and uh, you know they they were very gracious, and uh, uh, you know they came in. My you know Steve Ballmer was the primary uh, negotiator and uh, the primary. Um, my primary interaction point, aside from their corp dev, you know, group, um, but he had a lot of passion about, you know, about it. Again, they didn't know what I was working on until it was launched. But once it was launched, that was when when they came in, um, and we started talking about potential integrations with um, the things that they were working on. Like SharePoint was the um, the ultimate outgrowth in the collaboration uh, side of what they were doing with, you know, with Exchange. Um, uh, so anyway, I had, a, I had a great group of backers. I had a great group of people helping work on it. Um, as we uh, um, began to try to uh, bring it to market, um, uh, we experimented with a few uh, different mechanisms. I hired a great uh, head of sales. His name is Brian Halligan. He's the, he has since gone on to become the founder of HubSpot. Um, or co-founder, one of the one of the two co-founders of HubSpot, um, um, but um, going to market was extremely challenging. We came to market in 2000. Um, this was where the bubble was bursting. Um, enterprise uh, enterprise customers were hard to come by. Um, there began to become an architectural competitor, which is the web. Uh, centralization, uh, uh, you know, was a little bit more popular than I think uh, we had anticipated, um, you know, at that point early on, and it started to push us into uh, niche scenarios within enterprises, and those niches were. Um, those people who had to collaborate with people outside the company very dynamically. Because when you're working with people outside the company, they don't have any common infrastructure. So if you're, work, if you're in a major company working with an auditor um, or working with outside counsel on a deal, 
suddenly you can get everybody together you do your thing it's all encrypted they're they're you know really happy about that and then the thing vaporizes there is no server that it's sitting on and and they were they were very happy about that um who are the sorry who are the centralized competitors i mean who you're saying that it I, in a niche case primarily primarily um sharepoint was the emergent competitor um you know they notes was still notes notes was continuing and i don't think we were really uh we really achieved a whole lot of uh, traction in those accounts but anyone who had gone with exchange um i want to say this respectfully they were not deeply uh fulfilled by the collaboration uh uh capabilities of the native exchange and when sharepoint came out um sharepoint tried to take on more and more and more of that uh, you know we're the collaboration uh add on to exchange so much so that we'll just give it to you for free um so uh you know uh for the centralized I ones <laughs> yeah yeah and and you don't really try to compete when there's something that's a locomotive like that you try to find the areas where they're not uh their strength isn't and um the the cross organization things uh they were not succeeding at at all and so it was picking up it was picking up then 911 happened um and 911 um while obviously being immensely impactful and transformational to everything that was going on um it caused an explosion in growth um for our product and that was because we had some users that we actually didn't know um that were in certain agencies within the government who had been experimenting mm -hmm. with using it as a secure way of bringing people together. The moment 9/11 happened, um we had a an information sharing problem. And um in that era, hard to imagine in in this era, but in that era, every organization, the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, state and local governments, they were all silos. And they were silos by design going all the way back to the church committee of the 70s. You don't want information sharing among people whose job it is if you're if you're doing foreign work you stay away from domestic work like just stay far away so when 911 happened and yeah and the government said we must share um uh there was no infrastructure in place to do it none of the client server environments that were built at that time had had infrastructures that thought about this. So we had um we had very big uptake in three areas, domestic collaboration, trying uh, in in investigations domestically, um internationally we had NGOs who began using it because around that time there were also some some disasters, there was a tsunami that happened in uh, uh yeah yeah exactly. And um uh the third one um uh after um after the quick relatively quick war in Iraq um there was rebuilding and they needed infrastructure to help the ministers uh the new minister the the ministries that were trying to set up outside the green zone communicate with the people in the green zone and in in DC and among co uh uh um coalition partners they all were trying to um collaborate and organizations like USAID who were working with them and the Red Cross they all had to collaborate and there was no infrastructure the the infrastructure was destroyed and there was no real internet infrastructure to begin with so people were using groove on sat phones groove on um ad hoc IP networks set up by someone um not internet connected but IP networks 
And the nature of Groove technology was that all it needed was a network with peers. It didn't need central servers. So it, it really took off. Um, but commercially, we had taken more money than, um, than we could sustain with that audience. We had, by the time it was said and done, we had taken 144 million in uh, VC, and we were not going to be a unicorn. Um, it, it, you could just tell at that time. So we were purchased by Microsoft, um, who saw the, the dynamic collaboration being a good way to plug into the bottom end of SharePoint. And the, um, uh, you always had a separate client. It was not browser-based. It, it was not browser-based, and it couldn't be browser-based because it was, it was a distributed peer-to-peer -peer app. Um, Microsoft in SharePoint had a really hard problem in that um, SharePoint was web-based, and um, many of the customers wanted to take documents offline. Again, if you're an auditor, you know you connect to the network, you download a bunch of documents to your laptop, and you need to work with people um, when you're not necessarily connected to the corp net. Um, and we did that in our sleep. That was um, that was just a core scenario. So they, so Groove became uh, Microsoft Office Groove, which eventually became SharePoint Groove. You know, then SharePoint. <laughs> but um, just talking about Groove itself. So and the, the feature set. How different was it from Notes? And also how. Um, you said there was 140 million or so of investment. Did you have a significant share of that? Was this? Yeah, I probably put 15 in it, into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it was a. Um, everyone believed in it. If you pulled any user of the product, they were passionate, absolutely passionate, because there was nothing like it. The features were not even in the same ballpark as um, Notes, because Notes was an application development platform. This was actually more like the original Notes specs. It was a collection of pre-built tools that, could, that you could assemble into the solution that, you know, in this, in this interaction with you, I need a simple file sharing, and discussion tool, and maybe a calendaring tool. In this other one, I need forms with you know uh, a little thing where I can uh, have to-do lists. They, they were just different tools. But because of the difficulty of writing a distributed app on this ledger infrastructure, we never were able to make it a generalized um, development infrastructure. Which ended up being good because we weren't competing with it, you know. But um, but again, it, it it its use was very focused. For documents, it was powerful. You could download a document, work on it, upload it. It was it was very it was very good in collaborative editing of the same document. Right. It was very good in three dimensions: um, uh, documents, which have been solved other ways by now, um, messaging. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it even had a push to talk function. Like you could, it, it distributed voice clips just like it, you know, distributed other other things. But the other one, which actually hasn't been solved at all, even to this day, is that we we developed a system that was very very advanced um, in terms of the user list within the workspace that you're working on. So if I'm collaborating in a workspace um, with um, this person outside the, oh, let's say it's a deal. I've got this outside counsel, this inside counsel, this person who's on the other side, you know, et cetera. Um, uh, when you go and share something in that, that shared environment, it's extremely important to know who you're doing it with, um, because you might you don't want, you don't want to have this explosion of permutations, of of I've got a shared channel with you and I've got a shared channel with you and this pair and the, so we had ways of doing sidebars and 
in the um, member list, we used a combination of color, position, bold, and audio cues to let you know who was there. Did they just enter? Did they just leave? Are they in your organization, outside your organization, and so on? And um, the, the people who used it, once you started using it with that, it brought a dimension of peripheral awareness um, that, ha that I don't believe has ever been seen in a tool like that before. And, you know, it's great. It's just, you know, every product dies uh, eventually. <laughs> um, Lotus Notes had a long death and there are things, or, you know, or a long life, and there are things that are still in there that are not uh, implemented elsewhere. That's probably one of the things in Groove that I hope somebody finds a way to reproduce in some collaborative infrastructure because it was just, um, it's one of those things you feel when you're in it. Um, that was great. Okay, for the Microsoft, so you sold it. Yep. And you were happy to, well, you had to sell it. Yeah, it was one of those things where you, um, uh, I as a leader over the holidays made a decision that we couldn't be doing the same uh, thing that we were doing for the last year or two, you know, again, so I called my leadership team and basically we broke up into three, three tiger teams, three teams. Um, one, I can say this now, one was going to work on the potential of a Microsoft acquisition, one was going to work on the potential of an IBM acquisition, and one was a radical change that was going to, to lay off m much of the company and turn it into a pure open source um, uh, package. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we genuinely... Kind of. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, kind of like that. But we would lay off the sales and marketing side and, and try to fund it with a core thir you know, group of maybe 25 people, and, and that would be it. Mitch Kapor is very well connected to the open source community and always has been. So he facilitated incredible discussions in, the, in that because I had dealt with open source before, but I don't think I really understood uh, what, it, what it takes to do community development, developer community development, um, if you really want contribution. Um, and that was great. It was tremendous. Um, and both the IBM and Microsoft ones panned out. They both wanted to do it. and. Microsoft moved quicker, um, uh, and so 90 days later, uh, it was consummated. And I went to, uh, it was a fascinating uh, exercise. Um, Microsoft allowed the team as a part of it to, and this was a core negotiating thing, but to stay primarily in Boston area. Um, because there were a lot of good people, and uh, essentially that that ended up being the core of a of what is today the the Cambridge Development Center of Microsoft, which was thousands of people. Um, but the um, the stipulation for me was that I would go to uh, that I would that I would go on a schedule where I spent two weeks in Boston and two weeks in Redmond, um, and I would begin as CTO, but we'll see where the role goes from there. Um, and uh, uh, the two weeks here, two weeks there, lasted two weeks. Um, I, I realized I had, that my wife and I realized we had to get a place in Seattle, and I would spend most of the time out there, and we would figure it out. Our kids were, you know, in school at that, you know, by that point in time, and so we just made the best of it as a, you know, a uh, uh, commuting, you know, couple across, <laughs> across the country. Um, uh, but um, it was great. It was wonderful. And uh, I began, and sooner after I began, uh, I met with Bill and, S Bill and uh, Steve, and Bill said, you know, um, I'm thinking about something. Um, uh, I'm thinking about leaving the company and starting a foundation or, or giving full time to the foundation that Melinda and I had done. And, uh, 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 you know, 
what do you think about being uh, chief? So, you know, taking my taking taking my role or splitting my role with uh, Craig Mundy. Um, uh, and you know, he had a. You can't replace Bill Gates for crying out loud. Like he, the guy, he's the founder of the company. A fact to follow. Yeah, you you can't you you can't do it. And he didn't really you, you know word it in exactly that way, but. The point was essentially this. He wanted to devote his full time to something else. He would be, he's open and, and encouraging a, an extended transition so that um, he isn't, so that it was viable because I'm a new guy coming in and I'm supposed to be giving technical leadership to this large organization as an outsider. Uh, you know, he knew that 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 it was a difficult concept, um, uh, and um, essentially they said, "Look," um, and again, I'm I'm paraphrasing because they wouldn't have used exactly these words, but we've built the organization in a PC-centric way. We are, we are, you know, we we have windows in office on the pc we have a windows server it's a pc in iraq and we have you know we even have xbox which is essentially a pc wrapped up in uh in a gaming os you know and, and housing and everything is everything is pc centric you ray seem to have ridden the wave of change that our industry has had, you know, the, the, you know, you were ahead in the client server, you, you know, you, you saw this peer to peer thing coming. Um, you must have an opinion. Uh, so why don't you take the company? Why don't you figure out what your opinion is and, um, help, help lead the company, um, in that direction. Uh, and it's up to you how to do it. Um, and, it was a, you know, obviously you're not going to say no to that. Um, uh, but it was, um, I think we all kind of underestimated the, you know, the challenges involved. Um, so we announced it and, and Craig took Bill's outwardly facing jobs um, and I took Craig, uh, Bill's inwardly facing jobs. So Craig was... Uh, he traveled around the, the, the world, you know, 300 and some days a year, um, uh, meeting with governments and, and customers. I was focused on internal change. And I, within several months, I wrote, you know, a memo, uh, which is culturally how you do things in there, to try to uh, set the company on a path of pivoting from a box-centric to a service-centric um, uh, model, and you know, they're, stating that is obvious in in retrospect. And even at the time, it's like, yeah, okay, what's the big deal? We know the internet is coming. But then began the hard part of trying to work with the different groups to define agendas, you know, uh, development agendas that progressively lead you down that, down that path. Some of it could be done with existing groups who were willing uh, to, to do that change. And, you know, l strong leadership takes strong followership. You can't do without both. It doesn't work. And the groups, some groups were very receptive to wanting to change, and they really defined their future. I didn't have to, you know, I nudge a little and give them air cover and that's great. Um, some groups, um, some groups are kicking and screaming, and some groups are just blocking. And that's just the nature of of large organizations. Um, Steve Steve gave me an R and D budget that I could use to um, experiment and build things that either the groups were unable or unwilling to do. So I created this, this one of the group, the projects I created was um, 
constituted with two individuals. One, uh, one guy's name is Amitab Srivastav, and the other one is Dave Cutler. Um, and the project was called Red Dog at the time. Dave named it. But that was what would, e that became over time Azure. It was, the goal was cloud computing. That was uh, January of 2006 um, that we. And fully centralized. I mean, you, the peer, you had sort of given up the peer to peer. Well, yes and no. Yeah, I, I believe, I came to believe that, that it's a pendulum and Based on a solution, there are certain things that happen centralized, certain things that happen decentralized. Um, no one thing is going to win, but certainly cloud computing is the dominant force, and that SaaS and and you know those things that that by that you know that point that was pretty clear to me. It was not clear within the industry. Um, there was a whole part of the industry that was selling servers and client server architecture was still pretty prevalent um, in 2005. AWS launched, I think, in six or seven, six, seven. I can't remember. Um, but um, yeah, that's where that came from. And what, what was, what were the, um the terms of the sale to Microsoft for Groove. And I mean, what, um, what you, you were offered the chief architect once you were there. I mean, the initial role was not that, right? The initial role was, was uh, CTO. It was chief technical officer. And I was one of two Sorry. or three. I thought it was chief, so, yeah. No, 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 I was, was, I was initially was one of, and it, at the, the nature of the deal was most of the investors, not all, got their money back um, at, a, at a macro level. Um, it was not, a, pro, it was not a, uh, a great event from a VC perspective, but it wasn't the worst um, that it could have been. And um, I took a role. You know, all the people who were working there got great jobs and really good packages in set retention packages and that were quite good. That was a proxy for what they did for the past five years at, at Groove, um, and a proxy for the equity that they had. And um, I took a chief technical officer role, one of three, uh, Craig Mundy and David Vaskovich were the other two. It was several months after I was there that the, uh, that the concept of Bill leaving was discussed. And in June, this was 05 when we were acquired. It was June 06 when we um, uh, announced that I would become chief software architect and Craig would become chief research and strategy officer. Um, and Bill would be uh, with me, helping me for two years, um, you know, as part of the transition. And so for two years, um, uh, Bill and I went to every meeting together. <laughs> we sat in uh, ungodly numbers of meetings and reviews side by side where everyone was pitching Bill and Bill was trying to say, you're supposed to be talking to Ray. Um, uh, and, and that, you know, some, you know, some of that changed over time, but really it, really it happened the day that Bill walked out the door. <laughs> and did you and Bill ever disagree about the, I mean, how, how did that? No, never, in, yeah, never, in, never. Both in, sitting there listening with yeah. different opinions, right? Yeah, never, never in public. <laughs> and, and look, the guy's the founder of the organization. It's his organization. He can do what he likes. The the he didn't fully um, grasp, not intellectually grasp. He's a polymath. Like um, uh, he did not fully internalize all the implications of pivoting the whole company to services at that moment. Obviously, eventually he did. Um, so 
when we were in meetings, sometimes the, I would be trying to give feedback to steer the group in one way, and he was giving feedback based on his intuitions from his you know, past. And that's just the way it was, and we just worked through it. It's not, you know, uh, and, and of course there were times of conflict, but never, never with Bill. It was usually some group several layers down was trying to protect its turf, and such a transition would mean change, and somebody's trees would be moved, and so, um, you know, there's a lot of thrashing. Change is hard. Change, change is extremely difficult. And it was the, you know, essentially by late, by 2009, I had gotten in motion pretty much everything that, um, that needed to get in motion. Office 365 was, was moving. You know, it, it had just, I had started it as Office Live. There was Office Live, Windows Live, and Xbox Live, but eventually it migrated to its own, you know, pro cloud-based productivity strategy. Things were moving along, and the uh, the bi the bicoastal commuting was a little old, um, and so I talked with with uh, you know Steve, and uh, we worked out that by the end of 2010 I would. Uh, Pass the torch, and uh, a guy named Satya Nadella took over my Azure stuff, and uh, as a development lead, and uh, uh, they've done an amazing job at transition to services. Tremendous. But in terms of the the groups that either went were happy to adapt or resisted, it seems like you know some types of functions are just easier to, to adapt to a service. I mean, how could some of the ones that were most rooted in kind of PCs, I mean, how could they adapt? Um, you, can, uh, you, 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 can always, you can always find some way of adapting. The question is how, how much you drive it from within versus how much it has to be driven from, from outside. So Office, for example, drove it from within. You would, you, you would start by saying it's, um, it's a PC product. How can you adapt? However, we were fortunate that we had this, this, exist, this apparent existential threat that appeared in the form of Google Docs. And, and, I was going to ask you that. No, and so, and so you go, every time somebody would say, what do you mean? What are you talking about? You could just say, look at that. That may not be perfect, but that's what it means to take productivity into a different context. You know, it's, it's, it's sadly, they, Google Docs was a complete failure from a, from a re-envisioning the concept. What they did was they said, we're gonna take exactly what users view as spreadsheet presentation and, and database or whatever, spreadsheet, yeah word processing and we're just going to put it in the put it in a browser and yes they added some critically important functions like like collaborative editing and, and going to a URL but for the most part the paradigm is largely the same that helps the existing group reconceptualize their own stuff you know um, as it might go out there so they it took many generations but they they adapted, you know, they, they start, first started saying, how does the UI adapt? Then it's like, how does, what happens to the storage paradigm in the future? You know, it, it starts in files, then it goes to a centralized database, then it goes to a distributed database. You know, like they, they had, they had a, they, they had a, because the leaders were able to envision that future, they were able to incrementally get their, get their team to it. Um, uh, it was much harder for the server people. The Windows server people had servers on racks. They had a systems management server that could scale to an ungodly number like 50,000 servers, <laughs> which to them was like, what organization is going to have more than 50,000 servers? And they had a very difficult time um, 
within themselves understanding, no, 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 there's going to be millions of servers and it's all going to be sold as a service. So um, that one was a little bit more difficult to, you know, to navigate. And there are other groups with shades of gray, you know. Do you think your Plato experience, I mean, the idea of collaborative editing online and doing, I mean, you've had some experience in many guises with doc, uh, putting things like documents online and sharing. Look, the biggest, the biggest help that my past gave me um, in going to Microsoft um, was the fact that being in the collaboration business, I developed a, and having dealt with a lot of organizations with failed and successful um, deployments and trying to understand the essence of leadership um, and the importance of leadership in process change that is necessary. You can't just bring a tool in. You've got to drive a process change around the tool. Um, by the time I got to Microsoft, I was, I was you know, around 50 years old. And yeah, my birthday was my first year out there. And um, I took on the role knowing that it was not a technology um, job. It was a, a transformation job, an organization transformation and leadership job. And the tool of change was technology. Um, Bill and Steve had a, an appreciation that I could go to anyone at the edge of the organization and immediately bond with them on the technology that they were building. That's necessary for the job. That's what Bill, that's culturally what Bill instilled in the organization. Don't trust leadership that can't read your code. Um, um, but the change was um, a people um, thing and a collaboration thing. And my assistant did a, um, who managed my schedule, did an analysis in retrospect in 55, odd, you know, plus or minus percent of all my working hours in six years at Microsoft were spent in one-on-one -on -one to four-on-one, -on -one, meaning either individual one-on-one -on -one or a couple of people who were trying to cope with something um, and, or, or where I was trying to drive something. That, um, it's just a, it's a transformation thing. And it is, it ties into collaboration. Um, I think if you ask someone there, you would, I remember um, Butler Lamson and Jim Gray uh, took me aside at one conference. They said, um, we love your style. We love what you're trying to do, but you're destined to fail. And, and, and we want to help. And um, I said, why, why am I destined to fail? So we've been here a while. This is a, this is a cutthroat thing. And you're going to be dealing with people who are going to give you passive aggressive. They're going to give you active resistance. They're going to give you everything over the, and your, your style is a collaborative style. Um, you know, we, we, you know, you need to take on a more nuanced, um, uh, uh, leadership style. And, and I worked with those guys and I worked with a, a number of others, um, to help effect change because I was an outsider coming in. And, um, you know, the fact that I, the fact that the, that Azure and Office 365 in particular, um, uh, were able to nudge the future, um, three degree, you know, nudge, change the course of the super tanker a few degrees that ended up being a good few degrees, um, is just a fantastic thing. It's a, it's a fantastic feeling to see 10 years down the road, uh, you know, after I left, um, uh, that they did, they did make that, they did make that leap. Um, and I didn't do it. I was, you know, I was, I contributed to that, um, that nudging. So. And what, what about, um, search was also another big area at that time. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we, yeah. 
Search is a, is a really tough one because um, there are times when you're running a project of any kind in any company where you have a competitor and it's your instinct to chase after them, uh, it, like to do what they do. And um, the reality is in most cases, what you end up is you're chasing taillights and the taillights are getting dimmer and dimmer because they're in the lead and they're gaining momentum. Um, if you've got a situation like that, you have to leapfrog. You have to, you have to do good enough on some things and then you have to leapfrog in some dimension um, or, or, or part, plot a different course. They're going down this, these guardrails, you have to take it. In a, and um, search never did that, at least in my era. Um, Google just executed so well um, that, that it, it, you know, it didn't happen. Um, Microsoft tried to get into that. They tried to, you, you know, take the ad monetization model uh, uh, seriously. Um, it didn't change the, neither of those ultimately changed the, the, the course of the, of the company. Um, but I will say this, the, um, the investment in search and the investment in something people laugh at, the MSN, in retrospect, you know, the fact that they chased after AOL and, and, and all of this with MSN. The original MSN. That's right, that's right. Um, MSN Messenger was very popular, you know, probably the world's most popular messenger outside the US. Um, uh, those investments were key to the tr services transformation. I don't think people realize how hard it is. You have one group of people who did enterprise software in the company, enterprise productivity and enterprise servers. You have another group who, are, who did high scale services. The reason they were able to do Azure was because we took the DNA of both and put them into the common group. I used to hold a, a conference annually called SoftServe. It was like software and services. And you would have each one get up and tell horror stories about my worst night operating a service, my worst you know, enterprise. And you got a level of empathy among the people who were working on the things. I think that was quite, you know, quite key to, to that, uh, that transformation when all, when all is said and done. And when, when you came in, the, some of the antitrust stuff was quite recent. Yep. Um, I mean, had that, the impression I got is, you know, Microsoft would have done more with integrating things online, obviously, if, uh, I mean, that, that put a stop to quite a bit of the, the plans for integration, or am I, am I? No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. That's a, that's an alternate universe that never panned out. Like it's a, you know, the, the Microsoft pre antitrust was a different company. Um, much more aggressive, way aggressive, super aggressive. Like the people at Lotus and the PC industry really hated Microsoft because they competed so aggressively and they had all the, all the gears were turning. You know, the, the today analogy is Facebook. You know, they're, they're, they're just doing so well and they're, they're executing so well and they're dominant. Um, uh, and they're super aggressive. Um, um, the, the, the antitrust thing really has two primary components. And uh, in my opinion, everyone's got an opinion, but in my opinion, yes, there's the alternate reality, the alternate uh, technical product and market reality. That's one thing to ask yourself. But the other one is Bill, led by his father, deeply believed they were doing nothing wrong. They, it, like he was aggressive, but he deeply believed they were doing nothing wrong by giving more value to the consumer. By, by, it's like putting stories in Instagram, uh, you know, uh, taking st stories out of Snapchat and putting them in Instagram. But how could it be wrong by putting more 
features in the OS. And yes, they tied it all together. Leave the word tied out. That's a bad example. But they, they technically integrated it very strongly and all this stuff. Um, when, when the antitrust decision came down, Bill was affected by it um, because his belief system had, had been shaken up. Um, he decided for his own reasons that he didn't want to be CEO anymore. Um, so he gave Balmer CEO. Um, and the two of them, Balmer arguably, I wasn't there, but arguably either he wasn't ready to be it or Bill wasn't ready to let go of it. They're very human things, but they were not on the same page for several years. That caused a, a bunch of great senior leaders to leave and a bunch of other people to ascend that redefined the company. And so I think the biggest effect of the antitrust thing was not what was the alternate universe. It's what happened to the culture and leadership of the company as a side effect of the chaos that happened um, as of that decision. So. But Where? the alternate, because like the original uh, internet tidal wave tsunami memo that um, Bill Gates wrote, that's what you mean by the alternate universe yeah. as well, where he was talking about just making everything an integrated web service of some sort. But it, but it, was, it was more than I mean, one... Web, webifying every function of the company. The natural path of any dominant technology provider is going to be to look in every corner and see how you can integrate that function to enhance the value of what you're done what you do um, and if you focus on that you don't even have to worry about competitors okay like you can say they you do it to be evil to stop competitors but if you stay focused on increasing the value the rest doesn't matter so you see that in amazon today with the ever expansion of AWS and the ex ever expansion of their marketplace. You see it in, in Facebook, in the ever expansion of its communication tools. And, and it's a natural, um, it's the natural evolution of that, um, of that thing. And it's supercharged by the, the natural network effects that are present in social and in platforms. So. And you talked about the um, advertising-based uh, stuff. You said that Microsoft did not succeed or do that much with. But I mean, I thought that has become important in recent years, right? Well, it's it's a advertising. I think it's a large business in the absolute, but a, a very small business for Microsoft. I mean, if you if you just if you just squint your eyes for a second and say just compare their products and do a little game of removing the product and see if you still believe in the company. So I believe in Microsoft. What if you removed Office? Hmm. Okay, it's a different company. I believe in Microsoft. What if I removed Azure? A little different company. Um, those are massive. Um, if you removed Xbox, well, I think it's the same company, but it's a little bit smaller. What if you removed Bing? and the advertising. You know, yes, machine learning and a lot of the talent that Search brought into the company is helping them be a great AI company now. Um, but I don't believe that advertising contributes a material amount to their profitability. Okay, makes sense. So it might in the future, but it's certainly not in the current picture, you're saying. Yeah. Um, yep. The so then anything else about um, your time at Microsoft? Or no. Mentee? No. No. It was it was a great it was a great learning experience for me, and I I hope I did a little bit. I contributed a bit. I left in 2010, and um, I decided I was going to take a little bit of time rather than just doing another startup. Um, and um, I'll just touch on this very, very, very briefly. Um, 
in March of 2011, right after I had uh, uh, left, um, uh, there was the tsunami in Japan and uh, Fukushima melted down. And uh, someone who I had um, worked with and knew in the past, um, uh, uh, Joey Ito, um, uh, ended up bringing together um, myself and a group of about 30 people um, to Tokyo um, a week after the meltdowns happened. Uh, so things were still very <laughs> shaky um, uh, uh, and uh, high anxiety. But he brought a bunch of people together saying, how can we as technologists help? That, that simple question. And by the end of the week, uh, uh, we had um, a prototype of a system. We identified a need and had a prototype of a system in place to satisfy that need. The need was that people were being asked to, re everyone was afraid of radiation. And people were being uh, asked to relocate. Um, people didn't have any readings. They didn't know if the table next to you is irradiated um, or not. And neither the government nor the power company, TEPCO, were releasing radiation data. They, they, they were too busy. I mean, some of it, the government, is, some of it is cultural. They wouldn't release unvetted, scientifically vetted info. But everyone was just scrambling, trying to contain the, the situation. And uh, citizens were just freaking out. So uh, we decided that if we could get facts, uninterpreted facts, out to people, that people, scientists and others, would be able to interpret, is it safe or is it not safe? Um, so uh, a nonprofit was created called SafeCast. And uh, what we did initially was get laptops and a Geiger counter and a GPS and put some Tyvek suits on and strap those things to a car and started driving around the exclusion zone, measuring, and um, eventually um, built generation after generation after generation of IoT device um, to do that measurement so that individuals could build from a kit their own Geiger counter and tracker, um, put it on their bike or car, go around places that were relevant to them and their family. And every time they measured it, as a side effect of measuring it, it would also go to the cloud so everybody could see uh, the situation everywhere. And if you go to safecast.org right now you, and click on maps, you'll see that you know even after all these years, the 10th anniversary is coming up, um, there's an immense amount of data, immense amount of measurement, both of uh, radiation and increasingly air quality. Uh, roughly 10,000 volunteers, roughly 1,000 devices that are out there. It's really, uh, it's a nonprofit I believe in. It's an open data, citizen data nonprofit, not pro nuclear, anti nuclear. People work side by side. Um, anyway, I got turned on in that project into IoT. I'm a director of the nonprofit, but I'm also an engineer. And I started coding things up and helping them. And it was like returning to the 90s. You know, coding for microcontrollers now is almost the same as coding for a, an AT, uh, you know, a, a, a 286 chip. Back in the day, you're coding C. The operating system isn't really an operating system. It's a, it's like DOS was, um, free RTOS, and you know, it's like DOS. Um, it's it's all very. It was like going home again, uh, and the hardware piece was like the hardware that I did back in. Uh, you know, uh, high school and early college, I started building devices, and all of a sudden, hey, yeah, I know how to, I know, I know, I, I understand all this stuff, you know, um, enough, good enough, you know, well enough. Um, so I helped build them a uh, something they they did not have volunteers uh, on staff with enough talent to do. I developed them uh, a low power cellular. Um, uh, Geiger counter, solar powered, um, that they could deploy into the exclusion zone where they had occasional access um, 
and it would have to kind of stand alone and maintain itself. This was to augment the drive-based um, radiation measurement. As a part of doing that, I, um, I couldn't believe how hard it was to do the cellular. Cellular is high power. It has arcane commands. The business model is you have to pay per device per month. It was crazy. So um, that was that more or less uh, motivated the birth of my next startup, uh, which is Blues Wireless, uh, which is what I'm working on now. Uh, and uh, you know, essentially, or do I have? I don't even know what I did with it. It's a it's a tiny little uh, hardware card that uh, essentially embeds. Uh, cellular capability onto it and you buy the little card and embed it into your product and you don't have to pay a carrier you never have to talk to a carrier it's it has uh, crypto keys uh, burned on at manufacture and certificates so it it operates with TLS from birth with no management um, it's a fit you know it's a fixed price um, uh, and it's got very uh, simple uh, JSON interface to send data. All you have to worry about is your data and the results appear in the cloud. So anyway, I'm pretty excited about it. I'm, uh, you know, it's my nth startup. Um, it's, it's got, as I said, from an entrepreneurial perspective, it's, it's got all the wonderful attributes of uh, entrepreneurialism. Uh, it's a small group. Uh, uh, and the technology is wonderful and the product is wonderful and I know that we hit the mark but uh, building the go-to-market and, and customer base is, is going to be challenging and it'll be interesting to see uh, where it goes from there. Oh, very neat. I hope you'll contribute one to the museum. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and you, you skipped over talk. I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, Which but, might, come, might harken back to Plato just a little. Bit. No, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it, it's a very good point. The what led me to talk about blues was because Fukushima and Safecast um, made me aware of that pain, but I was not motivated enough to do the to do that company at that point in time. Um, in 2012, um, I had some other collaboration ideas brewing. Um, in essence, uh, just like Groove had a slice of, a, of, it took a slice of collaboration focused on a certain social uh, uh, mechanism, um, you know, the dynamic collaboration piece. Um, I was noticing in the emergence of cell phones that people were stopping, they weren't using it as a phone anymore. They, that, that texting was um, becoming dominant and the concept, the very concept of calling someone um, without prior coordination, you know, like dialing someone and having it ring your phone was becoming evil. Like people don't want to hear the phone ring. They want a text message from somebody first saying, is it okay to call or is now a good time? Like the, the, the whole social mechanic around real time um, interaction was changing. And I believed and I believe that the that a lot is lost um, right now in the in interpersonal communication, both in a social and in a business context, when you can't hear the nuance in someone's voice. Um, sometimes you can hear, is someone angry? Is someone concerned? Is someone showing empathy? Is somebody showing sadness? These things are very easy to perceive um, when you hear somebody. And we're using, we are developing this immense affordance of emojis and things like that to make up for the fact that that um, side channel um, is not present. So the goal of Taco was to create a messaging app that would be accepted by people 
um, in a work context um, as messaging, but had voice woven into it so seamlessly that people would make a natural transition much more often from, that started with text and you could just immediately um, shift into voice. And it also um, bridged very seamlessly um, ephemeral and persistent. That is, the thing about messaging is you can go and look back at something. The thing about voice is after you hang up, whatever happened in that conversation is gone. And if you want to share it collaboratively with someone, it's just very difficult to do so. So um, the concept of seamlessly going from texting or photos or whatever to voice to talking over voice um, recorded, um, recorded and transcribed to ephemeral, that whole uh, uh, seamless transition um, uh, was, was the problem space I was trying to take on. Um, it did all the things that you'd expect, push to talk and, and all of these things, trying to uh, help people collaborate using phones um, with an audio focus. Um, had a bunch of passionate users who are all um, vision impaired. It turns out that the, the biggest community that picked up on it were the people who appreciate audio. Um, but we, re we really didn't get uh, a whole lot of traction beyond there. Um, messaging is a very busy market. Um, and so I sold that company also to Microsoft and that became a core of uh, the real-time communications that became part of Skype and, and Teams. Um, okay. I did not but join I mean, some Microsoft. Of it, some of the functionality is like where you, for instance, uh, today you can get a voicemail transcribed and you can sort of go back and forth between the audio or the, or the text, right? So, yeah, it, so, some, of it, some of it is. Some, okay, so what has happened since then is that all messaging apps have added a voice record function um, in their apps, um, which enables you, if you really want to do that, to do it. Um, all of the call apps, meaning the native Android and iOS um, call functions, now have integrated um, a message function that if somebody's calling you, you can message them back saying, I'm not here. There, people are trying to cope with the, the seams between m mediums um, in different ways. It's not woven together the way that Taco did it, but that's okay. Um, you know, you've got to have, you've got to do experiments and that, <laughs> that's the way I do it, so. Great. So, um... Last, we want to we have some of these uh, sort of looking back overview questions. Sure. Is there anything else you wanted to say? You know, just about the, the more not about the not about the no not not about the biographical thing. I mean, I I my in terms of entrepreneurship or in terms of you know if I were talking to one of my kids or. A friend, or you know, who's a young engineer, and and I'm trying to look back at my own career and see what, uh, see if there are any patterns, any good patterns that uh, that might be still relevant. Um, I've been very fortunate to have been able to uh, maintain my core passion of building things um, throughout. Um, I learned mid-career something about myself that may not be relevant to everyone, but it's about myself. Um, I enjoy being in a leadership role, even in very large companies. I'm on the board of HP, I'm an a senior advisor at AT&T. Um, I like um, being in a senior role because you can make decisions that impact, that have a very broad impact. They're very small decisions that have a very broad impact. And you, you know, you, you can at least in theory make 
a big a, a big difference in a very leveraged uh, use of your of your experience. Um, but I also like being hands on. I like having I like I don't have to be coding, but I have to be very close to the design of a product. I have to, you know, I, there has to be some project that get, fulfills the builder piece of me. And because I managed to discover that mid-career, um, everything I've done, I've had the luxury of structuring my job to, you know, when I was chief software architect at Microsoft, I had my labs where I could have, I had a wonderful person named Lily Chang who, who had a team, who I funded a team to do all sorts, sorts of experimentation and social uh, concepts. They did something called bubbles and they did this and they did that. I got to scratch my itch in that way. Uh, you know, the, that's where Azure came from and, and, and things like that. Um, uh, right now, I'm, as I said, I'm on boards, but I'm doing my startup. So I'm getting both of those taken care of um, and so on. So I guess my, um, my biggest thing is really to try to understand yourself. You know, uh, uh, many startups have hacker hustler pairs. Um, you know, there's the, there's the person who's the product manager and the go-getter and they get funding and they understand the customer and they love the customer and the engineer who loves building and loves the complexity of the machine that they're debugging and, and all of that. Really try to understand who you are because you can be successful in any of those things. A, a hacker does not have to become a hustler. You know, you, you do not have to do any of these things. There are places in accomplishing these things, uh, doing both in, in, in doing all of it and learn to appreciate the value that others bring in that in that task. Some people, some people naturally are transactional salespeople. That's what they do. That's what they're good at. They like the competition of it all. Some people are solution sellers. They love the customer. They love to understand what the problem of the customer is. They love to make the customer happy. They're not transactional. They love they you know they love that. Some people are in the middle between that and projects, or product. They're product managers. They love shaping the, shaping the product. Just understand, try to understand who you are um, because uh, that will determine um, the opportunity space you know, that, that, uh, that's in front of you. And, and uh, I know this isn't directly relevant, but one of the things I recommend to people out of school all the time is go work for a big company right out of school. Don't have the very first thing um, that you want to do, make a million dollars as an, as a, doing a startup. You ultimately you have to understand who you're building for, and we all know for consumer products what it takes to build those. Like you can look at the next person over and understand what a chat app um, does, and yes, you can immediately go build that. But if someday you're going to build something that companies use, um, you know, restaurants, dry cleaners. Um, insurance agencies, uh, SpaceX, if you want to understand the machine that is an organization, there's no better way to do it than working in one and understanding the organizational dynamics, just like you understand social dynamics kind of intuitively. They are different. There are, there are all sorts of mechanisms that come into play, and it's, it's great to understand it before you make your decision how you want to uh, set your career. So. Really nice. <laughs> um, John, do you, there's several uh, of these global questions that I'm, John, do you have a feeling on how short or long? I mean, Ray, I'll read. Like one is, um, as you consider the challenges facing people and the planet, what new tech innovations are you most optimistic about making a positive <laughs> difference and why? 
what are your hopes for the future of technology for the benefit of humanity? And then, of course, the, the next question is, conversely, what are, what are the perils? What, what are the ones you're most concerned about? So in terms, of, in terms of looking forward, you know, I'm a technologist. I've spent most of my career in, in, um, in the collaborative aspect of it, the social and organizational collaboration aspects, and in pure you know, systems infrastructure. So with that filter, um, you know, the, the, I would say the, um, the biggest um, technological, the biggest peril I think is, is pretty apparent right now, and that is that many of the social um, tools that we've been using um, to help us uh, reduce transaction costs, you know, between in processes and uh, as social tools um, are now being used to fundamentally change uh, society. Um, you know, you've, you've, you've seen what's happened with elections, what's happened with Facebook, what's happened with activism. They can be used well and they can be used destructively. And I am, um, I don't think, you know, there's obviously no right and wrong from a pure technology perspective. But when you connect people with zero friction, um, uh, there are unintended consequences. And I think um, you know, any entrepreneur right now, any student, anyone um, who is a technologist who's not um, thinking about unintended consequences of what they do, I think is just simply irresponsible because we might have been able to gloss over that um, in the past. Um, we really shouldn't be doing that um, at this point in time. If you're, if you're building a project, at least try to go several steps forward and, and think about it. What I'm most excited about, and this is a bit self-serving because of the blues, but I do what I do because of what, the future that I see. Um, we've been collaborating with people. Um, I think we're moving into an era where we're collaborating with machines um, uh, to get things done. Um, and to get things done and, 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 and institute change in ways that we couldn't do before. One of the things I'm most excited about um, is the fact that uh, inexpensive IoT technology um, is going to be ubiquitous. It's going to be something that individual citizens um, can take out and instrument streams and instrument um, um, mountains and hillsides and other places that they might care about as individuals, individuals who are passionate about the environment or who care about a local ecosystem. Um, and you can use citizen science and the technology to learn about uh, the environment, to feel more connected with the environment, and to share that information with others so that aggregate um, trends can be, can be measured. I think this is extremely exciting and it comes at a time when governments are deinvesting from environmental um, initiatives and where both governments and um, uh, commercial enterprises are pred predisposed to only give good news um, and to sit on bad news. So um, from a technological perspective there are, there are many things that are going to happen but um, you know, again, I am, I'm pretty psyched about how, about the systems that can be done to promote uh, citizen science. And um, how can we ensure that innovative new technologies are inclusive, accessible, and ethical to benefit everybody? Wow. You know, that is a deep question, and I don't know if you mind if I defer on that one because it would be a rambling answer that would sound like a white man who's powerful is trying to uh, spout platitudes. Like, I, I don't know what we can do. I mean, what, what, we need is, what we need is fundamental change, and that change starts in early education. And uh, it's really not a technological topic. It's a, 
it's really, it's, it's something computer museums should do. Um, but the one who I wish you would bring in, because nobody is bringing him in. I don't get it. Um, Mitch Kapor has done more personally and investing through his Level Playing Field Institute in the area of, of helping underrepresented minorities um, uh, using technology as a tool. He and his wife, Frida, are just such good people and have done real investments. And in this, and in this era, in this BLM era, it's a shining light of what, like it's not the answer. He's working different programs that if scaled more, could work really well, I think, if the, you could find a way to scale it. But it's just absent from the, um, the conversation. I don't know why. Um, we, we can talk more offline, but actually we, we are talking to them. Good, there, good. There is, there is some uh, conversation there. So good. Happy to, Anything you can do to scale that uh, message. to talk about that's that. That's great. Actually. But yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and what would you like to be remembered for? <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Um, the thing that makes me feel best about my career um, and the thing that I would like to be remembered for is the impact that I had on individuals who either worked for me, worked with me, or were part of the ecosystem of my products where they were able to build more thriving businesses, particularly small businesses, um, around the technologies that we built. I, the, the, I personally feel the best um, when people would come up to me and say, you know, I've been work, I, it's 2020 and I'm still working on Lotus Notes and I built a company of 30 people and I put my kids through college that way and, and this person did this and this person did that. That to me is, um, the ultimate reward. Technology will come and go, and if I didn't, um, if I didn't develop a piece of infrastructure, someone else would. It, it, you know, these things are, are follow natural, um, natural paths. Um, but the the impact that you can have as a small business or a large business um, owner on other people's lives is irreplaceable. Absolutely ir irreplaceable. So. Nice. Um, and then here's an even easier one. Um, <laughs> drawing on your wealth of life experiences, what one word of advice would you give to a young innovator and entrepreneur? <laughs> you can think about this a little bit, but what is the <laughs> word and can you tell a story that illustrates why you chose it? And that I should well, you know, uh, normally that's asked. People are given some time to think about that, right? Yeah, but I can tell you that right off. I like to me. <laughs> I mean, to me the to me the word is build. Um, the reason I say that is because um, build kind of implies that you are either pursuing something a scratch that you have to itch. It's, it's pursuing something in the realm of your creativity um, or you're trying to solve a problem that somebody else has. You know, you're, you're, uh, uh, you're, you're a type of, you could build an organization, you could build a team, you could build uh, a software product, you could build a hardware product. You know, you, you can build almost anything, but building is the best form of activism uh, that you can have it, it, it. You know, to me personally, um, 
you can talk about things and you can make a difference talking about things. You can sway uh, people's opinions. You can, uh, you can uh, shape culture. However, what we build um, uh, is an action that we take that, that I know can, can impact things in, um, in very concrete ways. So from my perspective, it's, that's what it is. It's build. <laughs> Um, and what does the, what does this award mean to you to become a fellow? And I think, you know, some of the others are to, um, to join those, those other pioneers as a CHM fellow. Well, this is a little, this is a little odd. I am, I am flattered beyond, uh, what you can imagine. I, as you can tell by by the nature of this interview, I do I do what I do because I am passionate about it. I am very fortunate to have had uh, some success in it, um, uh, but I don't view myself generally. I view myself as a builder and as a a solver of problems. I um, there are people who I view in a completely different dimension from a um, uh, from an achievement and accomplishment perspective, when I look at the fellows list, um, that's what it's dominated by. And it's incredibly flattering uh, to, uh, to be perceived to be part of, uh, part of that group. Um, and all I can do is thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for that perception. <laughs> To face the, the pressing current needs of today's digital citizens, uh, what role do you see for CHM as a, as a leading museum to help inspire and inform technology citizens uh, in order to shape a better future? That's a, that's a really good, that, it's a really good question. I mean, there are, there are history and archival functions um, that CHM uniquely provides. And I think it's, it's important for the reason, the, the obvious reasons you, you should always have a good sense of history before you uh, go off and do something uh, new. There have been people who have made mistakes that you can learn from um, and so on. Um, but I actually believe there's also an educational component um, that CHM could uniquely provide, um, particularly in communities that um, may not have had the opportunity that some of us have had in being exposed to technology so early. I mean, I was, I was exposed well, well before my peers, um, uh, you know, because I was I was fortunate in a neighborhood that happened to get a grant. Um, you know, there were many, many schools and neighborhoods that did not that get those grants. And that exact same thing is happening today. Um, and I, I believe that CHM, um, in bringing together uh, people who have been accomplished in this area, um, has an opportunity to get that leadership out in front of people who might not have otherwise been exposed to it, um, potentially to serve as role models uh, um, uh, in, in terms of things that they could aspire to. Um, and then for the last really two that are related. Um, so, you know, we, we both talked about uh, um, you know, the advertising driven model and some of the excesses of Facebook, things like that. Um, obviously, you know, online communities can be, can have different characters. Um, do you think the, the sort of latter uses of this in ways that um, certainly you seem to agree can be destructive, you know, has this, how does this affect this kind of basic idea of bringing people together online that's been such a theme of your career? I mean, 
did you, I presume you didn't f foresee this back then, but I mean, how does it, how does it make you think about sort of bringing people together in this median now that it's revealed that there's kind of two, two sides to it? Well, not that, it, not that it's an excuse or a place to hide, but the vast majority of my career has been spent in what I read in Greifcoin, you know, computer-supported cooperative work. Um, it's the use of social uh, mechanisms and tools to help an organizational uh, goal or outcome um, uh, that that organization might have. Um, I, I, I believe that the dangers um, of social tools within the organization are are different than the than the dangers that they are externally. Um, uh, technologists are contributing to both, and so there are you know all all the huge all the cautions um, uh, you know are necessary. But but um, within the organization, essentially what you can do is draw the same lines that you do that that we have on the outside in pure social, which is. What are the undesirable mechanisms that are latent, that are currently happening within organizational con constructs? And how do social tools um, either reinforce that, uh, uh, that evil, that bad thing, or how are they used uh, you know, to mitigate it? So um, if there were if there was elitism or something like that, or racism, or or any character characteristic um, within an, a a given workplace, are those social tools that the workplace is providing helping um, uh, make things better or make things worse? And uh, social is now woven into every communication tool that we do online. If there were people who were um, uh, protectionist of their territory or heavily political uh, internally, um, those are going to take on a different, um, a different tone when augmented by, by tools. So all I can say is um, anyone who's implementing these things should be thinking about these se secondary effects. And, it's easiest to just simply, just as I said earlier, that it was easy for a group at Microsoft to look at Google Docs to understand what change might look like. Um, people within the workplace should be looking at Facebook and um, uh, Twitter um, and certain tweets that are out there and uh, say, well, wait, how could this impact the organization in ways that um, that are un unforeseen, but we could have directly drawn a, pa a line to. You know, the most obvious of those is already, has already been shown. I think everyone now is suffering Slack fatigue um, or Teams fatigue and certainly Zoom fatigue um, uh, because of the overuse um, of, of the tool and the complete lack of empathy and respect of the people on the other side of the wire. Um, you know, you, it, it, you know there, are, there, are, there are mechanisms that the tools could incorporate to help mitigate some of that, but, um, but they're not there yet. And um, I'll give you a really s silly one, and you'll, I mean, <laughs> you'll probably laugh at this, but when I got to Microsoft, um, I went from a startup to receiving 250 non-spam emails per day. And it's difficult to have a life um, and be a leader and go through that. Um, most of the leaders would just ignore it, but I have, a, I have a very difficult time doing that. And so what I did was I had one of my teams implement an Outlook add-on that um, computed a cost of a message by looking at the to and CC list um, 
and the number of words in the, in the, in the message. It was very crude, but it would attach a footer to, to each message so that when you do a reply to a message, it said, are you sure that this message will cost $672 in, uh, because, it w- because to process that message times those recipients. And so it, you know, just giving awareness, you know, yeah, you could put penalty mechanisms in, but it all begins with awareness. You know, what is it the, you know, it begins with awareness, then understanding, then empathy, then, you know, there's a step. You have to do something in the tool to help people appreciate the burden that they're imposing on the other side. And just getting people to hit reply instead of reply to all um, in email, um, you know, is a, at that time when email was uh, so prevalent, I, w- I would view as victory. Putting somebody in a, in a CC list instead of a to list, um, there's a different cost because socially, if you're copied, you tend to, it tends to be okay to ignore it, but if you're t- in the to list, socially you really should reply unless you're a jerk. Um, anyway. <laughs> Oh, okay, that makes sense. So there's different ways to yeah. mitigate. Um, last question, which is related, but the do you think um, the business model, I mean, certainly the contextual advertising has been blamed a lot for some of the business models. Do you think there, there, there are better business models behind online communities? Most of your work has been around ones under license to an organization, but... Um, Take this or don't take it if, if you want, but do you think do you think there are better business models? I don't believe there is a a viable business model. We're focused on the word business, meaning profits and funding. Um, I don't believe there's a viable business model for online uh, online community um, that that doesn't have the negative repercussions of of what's going on. I believe you can create paid communities, um, but by definition, they are bubbles. They are, um, you're only gonna pay for something that you want to be part of and that has information that you really want because it's your money. Um, So if there's a filter bubble issue right now um, this is, you know, paid communities make filter bubbles even more prevalent. You, you hang with people in that community that you know, that you like, that are like you. Um, so if you want to encourage diversity or diversity of thought, um, that's not likely um, a solution. Uh, and that's why I think if there is a solution, it's probably not associated with the word business. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the solution is. Um, uh, our current m- dominant communication model, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, is driven by the necessity to make a business out of it, and therefore it will focus on me- game dynamics. You know, on dynamics on on dynamics that are self-reinforcing and looping, because that'll give better returns. Um, it, if there is going to be a healthy community, it's got to be somehow open and moderated and not motivated by the profit. Uh, by profit. Um, I don't know what that is, um, but that to me is, is really, it's the only thing that, the only alternative in that realm. I mean, people have brought up, like before the internet, CompuServe, Minitel, various ones were pay by the minute or by time, but you can't really go back there because once you have free out there, that you, well, you can't get people to pay again. It's it's yeah. that, but also we have a much b- bigger awareness these days of in- inclusion, also, and and like at this point in time, we can't even get past internet access being a. Um, uh, you know, something that, you know, that people are, 
doing right now what they did then. They're paying the, the very low amounts for internet access, but that still excludes a bunch of people. So I, I don't know if you start raising the bar of paid communities. I don't, I think you would end up with good, healthy discussions, just like if you get the Atlantic or some, you know, some publication, you'll end up with well thought out arguments, um, but it's going to be a niche audience that, uh, that has access to it. I, I am most interested in the industry finding, um, and it's difficult because I said industry, but someone finding something that will become a, a substantial communication platform that is um, where the underlying mechanisms are open and free and inclusive. Um, and I don't think that can happen commercially. So. Right. Well, really wonderful one of you. Um, <laughs> I hope your I hope your memory card uh, didn't <laughs> is still had uh, some room on it. <laughs>